Your OLED screen will last longer if you do not turn it on. Unlike batteries, which will not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I gotta come up with a better. Speaking of batteries, I gotta come up with a better system for like when the power goes out. I have to wander all around my house dealing with each UPS. It's just I wish I, I don't know like uh, the, the USB connecting thing to your Mac that it'll shut itself down, but I never trust that. I do it myself. You know what I mean? Because I'm always just afraid it'll be like review these terminal windows and then it won't shut it down or whatever. So I just oh yeah yeah shut everything down the old fashioned way. I have too many UPSs, and then and then when when the power comes back on, I have to remember that like even if I don't want to turn these things back on, I have to activate that UPS because there's a router attached to it, right? And if you don't <laughs> have that router on, nothing works in the house. And uh, sounds like a lot of work. Why don't you just get laptops everywhere? Yeah, right. Yeah, my my laptops are plugged into UPS too. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to talk about some gift memberships, John? Do you want me to do the pitch? Do you want to do the pitch? How do you want to handle this? I have a moment of pause because I could do it, but I kind of want to hear what you would do. <laughs> this is a form of entertainment. All right. <laughs> oh my God. Here we go, kids. <laughs> it Buckle up. It's time to talk gift memberships. So uh, our friend, my friend and yours, John Syracuse, my best, worst friend, worst, best friend. I always get it wrong. I'm sorry, Merlin. You got it wrong twice. So there you go. <laughs> wait, wait, what's the right one then? Worst friend. It's like best friend, but the word best has been replaced with worst. No. For humor value. No, no, no. Because that that's that's semi-aggressively negative. And I thought he, that's it was what it more... is. I didn't make it up. I, no, but this it, is it's... this is the Casey version. The Casey version is recalling uh, trying to make a reference to another show, but making it nicer. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. A little okay. more friendly version. We'll, we'll chalk it up to niceness and not poor memory. <laughs> slash ineptitude uh so yeah my my worst best best worst friend uh john syracuse a copyright 2023 casey list anyways uh he has put in a genuinely large amount of work and i put in a slightly more more than zero amount of work in making gift memberships a thing on our website and our membership you know system so if you have a nerd in your life that probably is listening to this. I don't know how this is going to work. But hey, if you have a nerd in your life that might be interested in our plucky little uh, Apple-related show, and maybe they're a little bit too um, frugal, or as I would call myself, cheap, to pay for a membership, you can pay for a month or even a year of membership. You can go to atp.fm slash gift. You can gift this person a membership. Now, we never, ever, ever tell them that they've been gifted a membership. That is on you. Uh, in part because we're lazy and didn't have the time to do it, but mostly because we wanted you to be in control of how you message that whole thing. You can print something out. You can just send them an email. You can drop a random link in an iMessage conversation. Uh, I wouldn't recommend you using Beeper, but you know you can give it a shot. Uh, but nevertheless, one way or another, you can go to atp.fm slash gift to gift someone a membership. Now, a couple of quick points of order. You need to create an account with us that is free uh, for, for reasons in order to gift a membership. You can immediately delete that account afterwards if you so desire, uh, or you could sign up for yourself. You can stack gift memberships because John did not do the bare minimum of work. You can stack them. So if you are lucky enough to receive several gift memberships, they will stack such that it, when one runs out, the next one will begin. And you may not have to pay for a long time, which would be super fun. But yeah, atp.fm slash gift. It is all right there. John has written an FAQ for you to read. There's all sorts of wonderful and fun stuff that you can check out, atp.fm slash gift. The time is running out. We are recording this. I believe it's the 18th. I don't even know. I'm all over the place. Yes, it's Monday the 18th as we record this. These gifts are ready instantly. So you could be, if you are the kind to celebrate Christmas, you could be doing this on Christmas morning if necessary and, you know, write a very unusual URL on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope and say, hey, Merry Christmas to you. So <laughs> go check out hp.fm slash gift. John, anything to add? That was everything I dreamed it would be, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy for us. Classic Casey List promotion. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would add is uh, the way it works is if you're listening to this and you want a gift membership, just text somebody who you think is going to give it to you and say, hey, if you're looking for something to get me for the holidays, atp.fm slash gift, you have to deliver the URL to them and then they buy it for you. That's how the system works. They're not going to be listening to the show. How would they ever listen to the show? They don't know about the show. All they need to know is that this is a fun gift that you would like, you who's listening now. Give somebody else the URL. They'll get the hint. This is the equivalent of like leaving the catalog open on the table with the th- with thing you want circled and dog-eared. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this, I, I got to say, like, you know, as, as somebody who uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts for which I am paying members or Patreon supporters or whatever. And so that is one of the it, it is a great gift to give somebody because 
taking something that you're already doing in your life and making it a bit nicer is a fantastic gift, especially Mm -hmm. if it's the kind of thing that like the person probably would not have spent the money on it themselves for whatever reason. um, But you can make this thing nicer for them. Like that's that is always the best kind of gift. Like you buy somebody like a really good tool for some for some hobby they're doing or or you like, you know, upgrade something for them that, you know, they would really appreciate that they wouldn't necessarily spend the money on or, you know, or something like that. That's that that's like the category of great gifts, in my opinion. And this is exactly in that category. Like if for someone who likes the show, if they're on a member and, and you buy the membership like that just makes the show better for them. So that's that's a, it's a wonderful thing. Whenever there's a podcast that I listen to that has a paid version, I almost always get it. And I'm always happier with it because I honestly I don't you know like having to skip ads if I don't have to. I'd rather just have them not be there. Um, and any kind of bonus stuff that comes along with it is very helpful. Indeed, atp.fm slash gift. Give a gift to you, to your friend, to your loved one. And by doing it through us, you're giving a gift to us too. So hey, thanks. Uh, but anyways, yeah, check it out. And we appreciate it. Let's do some follow up. We have a handful of people that have written in with regard to an Ask ATP last week about Apple devices and OLED burn in. Uh, we start with J- David Gian Curcio. I hope I got that right. Uh, I actually did have burn in issues on my iPhone XS. I had it plugged in and on a stand at work, using it as an always on display before that was a feature. And fuzzy versions of the battery, Wi Fi strength, and clock became permanent fixtures on my screen. Uh, this is, I think, effectively nightmare fuel for John Syracuse. Yeah, that's just, yeah. just how burn in works. And by the way, the reason they were fuzzy, uh, we didn't mention this last week, but, but in, the, in the long list of uh, burn in mitigation techniques that OLED screens use are something that I believe plasma screens also use, which is like they shift the image a little bit uh, from side to side. So it's not always on in the same place. I don't know if the 10s did this, but I believe the current ones do it as well. So th- I always question the value of that feature and by the way modern tvs in case you're worried that that you're going to be losing parts of the picture which you did back in the battle days of plasma modern tvs over provision the pixels so even when they pixel shift it you aren't losing any pixels they're just shifting the image around uh and not lighting up some pixels on one side the the good modern tvs do that oh so like the so so the physical panel is actually larger than the picture by a little bit to by a little bit yeah to because it used to be in the plasma days like you do that you know they have these various calibration tests where it will show you like this you should be able to see this rectangle and it would put a thin rectangle around the whole screen right and you'd know if you had like the the what do you call it the overscan thing on you'd be like oh I can't see the rectangle it's screwed up so you fix the overscan feature but the pixel shift or pixel orbiter thing it would cut off one of the borders. But then when it shifted to like the left, you wouldn't see the left border anymore because it would be like a one pixel line. It would be shifted off the edge. Now I believe all the good all the good uh, OLED TVs have enough pixels to move it around. I think they do that on most, on like computer monitors. I don't know if the iPhone does it. It's a very difficult thing to find out because they tend not to list it. They will list the pixel shift feature under some branded name, but they won't always say, oh, and also we over provision by seven pixels on all edges to, to handle this. Pixels are so small now. On Reddit displays, place, it's hard to tell. But on TVs, you can, I think you can actually see this if you look up real close. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out, too, like, you know, this this instance of, of burning on a XS, um, a, as David said, who, who wrote it in, like, this was kind of creating an always-on situation. Plugged in and on a stand at work, using it as an always-on display before there was a feature. So what this means is, you know, because with the iPhone, you can tell it to never sleep the screen. Like, that's a setting you, that you, you, can have, you have access to. Any phone can be left on all the time. I don't recommend this for lots of reasons, but this is, again, this is what happened here. And so this kind of show is like, you know, like when Always On came out as a feature, some people were like, wait, why can't they, why can't they have this like added via software to the older models? One of the technical reasons why they might not have wanted to do that or might not be, have been able to do that is because they knew when launching the 14 Pro, they knew this was going to be a feature of it. And so they were, and they were able to, make decisions with like what exactly what specs the OLED panel had, what kind of OLED it was, how how it was going to be driven, within what range it was going to be driven. And they were able to launch this feature knowing what the hardware was going to be for it, slash pick the hardware knowing that this feature was going to be important for them, so that they could they could have a panel that could, you know, get more use this way without having burn and become a problem. Whereas on the older phones, that wasn't necessarily possible. As time goes on, like, you know, components change, types of OLEDs change, and different ones have different tolerances for this. So, you know, the modern ones where they actually launched this feature, you know, in mind with these hardware panels um, can usually take it a lot better. Oh, and uh, getting back to my point about the uh, the pixel orbiting and my doubt about the feature, like, imagine you've got a rectangle that's your little battery. Uh, pretend that it's always full. It's just a white rectangle. 
orbiting it by a few pixels, like shifting it over and up and left and right by a few pixels, all that's going to do is make a slightly less burned in halo around the burned in <laughs> rectangle. Like, <laughs> like you're not actually stopping burning. You're just trying to spread it around by a tiny little bit. So I've never been a fan of that feature. I'm like, I don't, I don't think this helps me. Like having, having a fuzzy burned in rectangle for my battery instead of a crisp one, it's the rectangle is still there, but you know that people do what they can. Jameson Weiss writes, I am currently using an iPhone 14 Pro that shows no signs of burn-in, but my previous phone, an iPhone 11 Pro, did show noticeable burn-in around the menu bar icons. I could very faintly but noticeably see the ghosts of the battery icon and the clock in the Wi-Fi symbol. Keith writes, my Apple Watch Series 5 and iPhone 13 Pro Max both have OLED burn-in. The watch has the complications burned in and the phone has the status bar burned in. Uh, So it's uh, apparently on the watch as well. And then an anonymous person writes, Apple Store technicians have a diagnostic that will check and tell us if the device has developed a display profile. The display profile helps mitigate through software OLED burn-in. When we do repairs such as a rear system or mid-system replacement, we must run an additional diagnostic during repair. This test involves connecting the customer's original rear or mid-system and the repaired device to a Mac, which then allows us to transfer the display profile. We do these steps because the display itself does not have the components to store the display profile, and it is instead stored on the main logic board. When this display profile test was first introduced, we originally had to replace the whole device when it was flagged because we did not have the tools to perform the display profile transfer. But now we perform this repair daily. I personally have seen a display show burn-in before performing this display profile transfer diagnostic. Anecdotally, always on display has not led to an increase in these display profile transfers that I've noticed. Further, instances of noticeable burn-in have also been very rare. This is what I was talking about last week with uh, burn-in mitigation. Basically, if you don't drive every single pixel on the display to the maximum amount, you have a little bit of headroom. So if the displays get worn out and they're a little bit more dim, the display can compensate by sending essentially more electricity to that pixel to make it the same brightness as its neighbors. Televisions do this through a series of sort of, they, again, they have branded names for everything in televisions, but like they do these cycles when the display is turned off. I'm not quite sure how, but they do. But when the, when, the, when your television is turned off, if you have a modern OLED television, at some regular interval, it does some test to essentially recalibrate itself to make sure all the pixels are the same brightness, every single individual subpixel, right? So if you've worn out the red sub, one particular red subpixel is not as bright as its neighbor, they can figure that out somehow, and they will give that red subpixel a little bit more electricity than its neighbor, basically trying to even it out. Uh, the uh, artings.com uh, burn-in test that they've been running for years actually ran into this recently because the test that they were doing didn't allow certain brands to run their sort of display update cycle thing because like they all they all cycle based on like oh you have to be idle for this amount of time or whatever and they were just running the the screens just you know 24 hours a day or something close to it so it never got to run the compensation cycle so it looked like the burn-in was awful but then once they figured that out once they figured out how to detect when it's running the cycle they let it run its cycle and it was a dramatic difference um and so what this uh, apple store technician is telling us is basically that but for iphones that the iphone also can figure out oh you've worn out these pixels and now we need to drive them a little bit harder and that display profile i imagine it's like a big map of like hey for every single sub pixel on the display does it need a little bit more juice than its neighbors and how much more and the fact that they used to just chuck the whole phone or eventually recycle it or whatever because they couldn't just transfer the profile which is just it's just data right it's just, they couldn't transfer it's like well you know, we have to give you an all new phone because there's no way I can transfer this stuff. It's good that they've uh, introduced the ability to transfer it. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's part of how you make OLEDs, quote unquote, not burn in. You're still wearing out the pixels as every time. It's like vinyl, Casey. Every time you use it, you're wearing it out a little bit. <laughs> Jeez, Using wow. it is wearing it out. There is no way to use it without wearing it out. Every time your screen is on, you are degrading the organic compounds and those OLED pixels. But if you weren't driving them at the maximum amount, you've got a little bit of headroom and the display can figure it out and compensate for it. All right, let's talk stolen device protection in the 17.3 beta. Russell Quinn writes, trusted locations is... Let me get some context here. I'm sorry. So one of the things that they've said is you you have an an hour delay when you go to do certain operations, like changing your Apple ID password, except... If you're at a trusted location, which is allegedly like work and home, 
So Russell Quinn writes, trusted locations is kind of flawed because most people will have those very addresses, home and work, in their contacts app right there in the My Card at the top. If your phone is swiped in a bar, etc., there's a reasonable chance that you're not that far from home. Russell is implying then that, you know, the thief could go drive or train or what have you to your house or your work as quickly as possible. And hopefully for them, change your uh, change your Apple ID password before you have the chance to lock all of this using iCloud on another device. So yeah, we didn't have this in here, but there was some other feedback from, I guess, someone who has used the beta that these these locations, these trusted location things are configurable it's not like it demands to be home and work and it just pulls them from your address book or something and i think there either there either is some kind of lock on those locations or maybe the person was saying there should be uh, a lock meaning like if someone gets your phone that they can't see or change those locations or whatever but I, i'm not quite sure how that would be possible once they have your phone and your passcode but we'll see how this works out for the people who are very paranoid i assume what you can do is just say there are no trusted locations i always have to wait an hour so then you eliminate this whole issue but the, it's asking people to make the security and convenience straight off is always dangerous because they'll always pick convenience right <laughs> you kind of if you if you don't sort of default them to having like at least their home be a safe location, uh, they're not going to like add it themselves. They're like, why would I make my life more difficult? Or they wouldn't, you know, maybe someone would convince them to do it. But the first time they had to to, uh, you know, wait an hour, uh, they would get rid of it as soon as possible. So, you know, interested to see how this shakes out when they actually ship this feature and what the actual effect is based on the defaults they choose. Richard Harris also made an, in an interesting point. You described a scenario where if my phone and its passcode have been stolen while I am out, but I have enabled stolen device protection, I can use someone else's web browser within an hour to log into iCloud.com and find or wipe my phone. However, with two-factor on in my iCloud account, I cannot log into iCloud.com from an untrusted browser without also entering the six digits that are sent to my trusted device, which in this case was just stolen. Since most people should have two-factor enabled on their iCloud account, and most people do not leave the house carrying their iPad or laptop, even if they have such devices, how does the new stolen device protection feature help in the most frequently cited scenarios? I don't have a good answer for this other than, you know, if you have, you know, like say 1Password or something like that, you could potentially log into your 1Password account on the web. However, that also requires a very, very large GUID looking thing, which I certainly do not have memorized and would also be stored in, you know, a 1Password on a trusted device, which it presumably has just been stolen. So I, I don't have a good answer for this. Yeah, well, that that's why we were talking about whether one hour is the right amount of time because there are solutions to this okay so obviously if you're within an hour of your house and you can get back to your house and if you're like us and have more than one apple device like you don't need your phone you can use a mac that is a trusted device or you know other other ways to get into it also uh there are backup codes i don't know if a backup code will be sufficient on its own because i haven't actually tried this but it is a thing that exists where you can get backup codes to sort of recover if all else fails and you should have those printed out and stored in a physically secure location that hopefully you can get to within an hour uh, and then the final thing is, you know, again, if you if you can actually get home, you can sign in from one of your Macs that is already able to sign into iCloud without going through the two factor stuff because it's always signed in because, you know, yeah. So I'm, I'm again, I'm interested to see how Apple pitches this. Uh, the idea is that uh, if your phone is stolen and you that hour timer starts, hopefully you can do something within that hour to get yourself in. Obviously, you can't do anything if you don't have a phone and you're alone. You have to find somebody else who's going to let you use their web browser or whatever. But if they do, depending on how nerdy you are, there are various scenarios you can imagine, like, you know, using some sort of uh, web uh, VPN interface to get into your house and remotely control a computer that's already signed into your iCloud account, yada, yada, yada. Um, backup code seems like the most regular person friendly but even that's tough like what you do is you'd have those codes printed out you'd have them in your wallet somewhere you would not label them that's a little security tip don't say these are my apple id pass uh, backup codes <laughs> just put them on a piece of paper you know what they are bury them in some pocket of your wallet that you don't frequently use make sure it's a waterproof and the ink is not going to smear or whatever and then worst case scenario you can you know find a browser and log in and again i don't know if the backup code all by itself is sufficient it might also require a two-factor um so that's, you know, one hour is what I think the the time is in 17.3 uh, beta. Having that time be configurable might be interesting for people who care. But again, when you ask people to choose between security and convenience, maybe things don't come out the way you want. So we'll see how it goes. Again, this is beta. hasn't yet shipped. 
All right. Mathos Woolard writes, one thing to note in the EU's removable battery legislation is that they explicitly carve out exceptions for devices that have a high level of water resistance. So maybe batteries don't have to be so easily removable? Question mark. Yeah, I don't think any of this stuff is finalized. I do wonder if Apple isn't currently at that high level of resistance, if they wouldn't make sure they're at their high level of resistance, just so they don't have to do the battery thing. (laughs) Uh, yeah, again, we'll see how we'll see what actually comes out of this uh, as a uh, law or guideline or whatever when they're done. Skeen harshly writes, oh, "That is a great name. My word! Uh, it it is absolutely correct." Or I'm sorry, John Syracuse is absolutely correct about Vexed. And the best part is, someone ported it to iOS as Vexed Plus. This was John's beloved Palm OS game, and apparently, you can get it on your iOS device. So that's cool. I immediately snagged that. Although one thing I noticed: this is the part of the. Part of uh, any kind of retro type uh, gaming thing. I got it on my iPhone. I'm like, hey, it's the same levels I remember. And it looks a little different because it's on your iPhone or whatever. And then I realized, oh, it feels totally different when I'm swiping the blocks with my finger than using a stylus. And I know that sounds dumb, (laughs) right? But it's just like, what is my memory of playing Vexed? Apparently, a big part of my memory of playing Vexed is pushing little blocks with a stylus. (laughs) <laughs> sorry i mean i i gotta say like having having playing with my palm pilot like having you know played hearts and stuff on it now and my mealborn game not a palm pilot whatever um <laughs> my palm <laughs> os device that was on my nintendo it was it was released after the pilot 1000 and pilot 5000 models but not that much after um anyway so a big part of the feel of what like you know what gives me the, the nostalgia and the feel of it is the feel of having that stylus and tapping those little things on the screen it's re- it's it's something that we don't have anymore really like you know you, you kind of have it with the apple pencil on the ipad but not really like it's it's the screen it, doesn't squish yeah it's a very different feeling um and what we have now is generally better for almost every way. Like it's, it's, it's generally much better now. And I'm not saying we should go back to this. And if you try an old resistive, you know, uh, squish screen like this, you will almost certainly think it's worse, but it is different. And so if you play these same games on a touch screen or with a mouse, they are different and it doesn't feel the same. So if what you're looking for is the nostalgia of how it used to feel to use a, excuse me, Palm OS device, not a Palm <laughs> Pilot, John. Um, if you're looking for that feel, you're not going to get it right with like any kind of emulation with a touch screen or a mouse pointer. And it was kind of, you know, so the the idea of direct manipulation, I've talked about this in many past shows, but like moving a block in Vex, basically you have these little blocks and they're actually very small on the screen. They're much smaller than they would be like to be good touch targets. Moving that block with the stylus on a Palm device feels like direct manipulation. You feel like, especially since the screen squishes, you feel like you're shoving the block off because there's gravity on the screen. So if you shove the block off of another block, it just falls down, right? You feel like you're directly manipulating the block with your little prod, right? When you play on the, the iOS version, which is a faithful port, first of all, your finger entirely covers the block and maybe a little bit of some of its neighbors because the blocks are, again, not, they're not 44 points. They're much smaller than that, right? You can't really see what you're doing. And when you slide with your finger, yeah, it pushes the block over. But by the time you lift your finger up so you can see the screen again, the block has already basically fallen. It doesn't feel like you're directly manipulating. It feels almost like you're swiping on the screen in the vague area of the block and then a block goes down. It is much less satisfying. <laughs> uh, but I would still say, I mean, no one's going to get a, a uh, buy a Palm on eBay so they can play this game. So definitely check out the game. <laughs> I think it's free. I don't know. I, I buy iOS apps without thinking about it. it was, it's either free or extremely cheap. But check it out because it is a fun puzzle game. It is very much like every puzzle game you've ever seen. Like, oh, it's a little bit like Tetris, a little bit like Bejeweled, a little bit like this, but it's not exactly like any of them. And the levels are very clever and they do a good job of teaching you the mechanics. You should check it out and go through the first 10 levels or something. Have some fun. By the way, I tried installing it on my Palm 5X and it crashed. <laughs> so I'll have to figure out maybe I had like the wrong version or yeah. maybe I had like, I, I think I might have had too new of a version because, you know, what with the Palm devices, like you went from these super simple 160 by 160 monochrome and then grayscale screens over the following years, you went to higher resolution screens, much faster processors, color screens, uh, and and various different OS and networking upgrades and stuff like that. Uh, and so a lot of the like kind of high end Palm OS games are were really made for those later systems, and they don't necessarily work <laughs> on on my Palm Five X running OS, whatever it is. Um, so I gotta maybe find an old version. 
Let's talk about Apple's required reasons thing for certain APIs. This uh, blew up, I want to say two, three months ago. They decided that for certain APIs, a lot of which I think made sense, but some of which, uh, particularly user defaults, was quite surprising. Uh, user defaults is the thing that most app developers use to store like preferences for their app or apps and things of that nature. And they were saying, you know, it was very, very scary uh, what Apple was not really threatening, but saying they were going to do that, you know, oh, you're going to have to provide reasons for using user defaults and it's going to be big and scary. And since every freaking app use, use, uses user defaults, it seemed a bit silly. So apparently Apple's updated its uh, required reasons thing for using certain APIs and user defaults has new reasons. It has three of them with very odd code names. Uh, the first one, declare this reason to, or I guess this is why you would use it, declare this reason to access user defaults to read and write information that is only available, accessible Excuse me, to the apps, app extensions, and app clips that are members of the same app group as the app itself. So in other words, stuff that you write that only you and your apps can touch. The next one, declare this reason if your third-party SDK is providing a wrapper function around the user defaults APIs for the app to use, and you only access the user defaults APIs when, you, when the app calls your wrapper function. This reason may only be declared by third-party SDKs. This reason may not be declared if your third-party SDK was created primarily to wrap the, the required reason APIs. So jump in, fellas, if I've got this wrong, but I guess if I were to vend a framework or a you know a facade in front of user defaults, then I could claim this to explain why I'm using user defaults. Is that about what this sounds like to no, you? No, I believe it's saying you can't change, you can't claim this. So if, if what this what the way I interpret this is if you make a library that happens to allow user defaults access as kind of, you know, some other kind of I see. like yeah, ancillary I function right. then well, yes. I think like if, if the SDK had its own settings, for example. Like yes. It had some persistent state that's part of the SDK that it stores and it wants to store them in your app's user defaults because it's running within your app. Right. But if you if you happen to make like, you know, Swift defaults as your library name and it's really just a thin mm -hmm. wrapper around you uh, around user defaults without much other purpose. And I think they're saying you can't use this code for that. Well, I mean, I'm not sure about that. But what they say is if your SDK was created primarily to wrap required reason APIs, not necessarily this API user defaults, but like you can't use it as like a, uh, you know, uh, uh, API laundering. Like essentially you make an SDK <laughs> yeah. and it's like, call through this SDK and we'll get any, of your API, any other required reason APIs. It's interesting. I mean, the, the first one that Casey read was the one that I was complaining about uh, back before I realized this doesn't, doesn't apply to Mac apps yet. Um, was that, hey, app groups, it's an Apple concept. Everyone uses it. It's it, Having a shared user defaults among app groups is a huge use case. So finally they addressed that. So that's great. Um, the third party one, I really didn't expect them to do, but I guess... It's been so long and they've gotten so much feedback that they realize a lot of people are in this situation and they use a third-party SDK. That SDK has some setting somewhere that it persists and it's going to persist them in your app's user defaults because right? that's where, like where else would it put them? It's, you know, so they have to allow that. And I think this bottom part is, I guess, preventing it from being a, an API laundering thing. Maybe it's like a third-party SDK for just wrapping user defaults, I don't see why that would be banned. But reading this language, it makes it seem like it would be. Because it's like, well, right. it only it's only exists, it's, it's a library, a convenience library around user defaults. But what are you using it for? To read and write your own app's user defaults. Like, that's not laundering anything. You could have done that yourself. You're just using a library for it. That's why I think the part where it says, create it primarily to wrap required reason APIs, not the, specifically the user defaults API, but any of the other APIs that are on the list that you have to have reasons for. We're just listing the ones for user defaults because it was the most egregious one in the original uh, list of APIs because everybody's app uses it. And it was so restrictive that you just couldn't do basic app things. So they're addressing that here. Yeah. And when when this first uh, was announced, I believe early, like in the late summer, or early fall, um, when we, we did talk about it, and uh, I believe I said the same point then, so I'll, I'll be quick this time, but we don't usually know like the the level of trickery and scamminess that apps try to pull off to try to track people and do creepy stuff and so whenever we see stuff like this from apple like some kind of weird new privacy or security requirement that it seems like it shouldn't be necessary or it seems like unnecessarily persnickety generally the reason is this has been abused or is being abused for some kind of creepy thing and we just don't necessarily know about it or could or can't quite figure out like how could this be abused but so in this case like i'm sure they added these things carefully and with their 
inscrutable numbers. I, why are these numbered the way they are? I don't know. But whatever, whatever the reason is behind this obtuse uh, requirement they're creating here, it is probably because it was actively being exploited in the wild. So every single word of this, like every little clause, every condition, every exclusion, I guarantee you it was because somebody was being tricky with this stuff. And then finally, declare this reason to access user defaults and read the blah, blah, blah key to retrieve the managed app configuration set by MDM, mobile device management, or to set the yada, yada, yada key to store feedback information to be queried over MDM as described in the Apple mobile device management protocol reference documentation. Yeah, so these reasons, I mean, again, we're just focusing on user defaults. We'll put a link in the show notes to all the new reasons, but there are a ton of them. And it's been a while since we talked about this, but this just shows how thorough Apple has been in making sure that all the use cases that they got feedback about are addressed. So just plain old user defaults. There's the one thing that I thought of, which is just obvious, app groups, right? Then there's a third-party SDK thing, which we didn't even discuss last time. Then there's the MDM thing, which we definitely didn't discuss this time. But you can just see, you can say, oh, you look at that, oh, I see how that could affect people. Oh, I see how that could, you know, how many people have their own uh, apps that they distribute over MDM to their corporate devices that are owned by their company? And they're like, well, our thing doesn't work anymore because we access user defaults and we do it through the MDM thing. And no one who doesn't have an MDM distributed app is thinking of that, but so many apps out there do that. So this, Apple took a long time to, come up with this list, but it seems like they've addressed a lot of stuff. Now, I'm sure there's still stuff that they missed, but this is a much bigger expansion than I thought they would have. Again, look at the full list. This is just user defaults, but like I expected maybe, maybe they'd allow app groups, but they added much more above and beyond that. So I hope this is now at the level where let's say 98% of the apps fit within it. It's still, I don't think they've changed anything about the strictness of it. I think there's some kind of timeline of like, well, it'll be advisory for a while, but then eventually they'll require it. But Apple's usually pretty good about not coming up with a new set of requirements and making it mandatory on day one and just destroying their entire app ecosystem. They'll, you know, do it slowly and hopefully get to the point where everybody's on board. And again, crossing my fingers, this still does not apply to Mac apps. I hope it never does. Please, Apple, leave the Mac alone. (laughs) (laughs) uh also real-time follow-up from who someone in the chat i've already lost where it was uh mtz federico uh pointed out that if you don't have an iphone or other apple device to use find my you can use find devices on icloud.com um when you sign in you might be asked to enter a verification code sent to a trusted device if you lost your only trusted device or otherwise can't get the code select the find devices button instead of entering a code I don't really know what that means, and I don't have the, the ability to research it right this second, but apparently they have a plan for you if you are in that situation. And this does not seem to indicate that you need a backup code. So I'm not really sure what the situation is here, but it's apparently been at least considered. Yeah, these are all things we never want to find out. And unlike uh, restoring from your backups, you can't, it's not easy to safely rehearse this. Like I wouldn't, like if you rehearse it and you find a problem with your system, guess what? You just intentionally lock yourself out of your own app ID forever. So don't. <laughs> right maybe test this to the limit but i guess you know it's up to apple to try to communicate this to people and say here's what you need to do to be safe right now it's not entirely clear we are supported this episode exclusively by atp members please consider becoming a member today you get all sorts of fun goodies as a member the number one thing you get is an ad free version of the show we give you a special rss feed that's exclusive to your account and you get in that feed ad free versions of all of our episodes so you still get everything else you know the, all the all the content's always there you get ad free versions as well now you also have a bootleg version available this is a special it's it's basically a feed of our live stream uncut unedited and published right after the live stream ends so you get earlier than the regular episode released usually by about 12 or 24 hours you get the release of the episode with no edits whatsoever. So you get all of our like pre and post chatter, our title selection talk, a little bit of, you know, bonus stuff here and there beginning and end. Plus you get kind of, you know, the, the, the delightful imperfections of a live show. You get occasional flubs of jokes. You get Casey swearing. You get, you know, occasionally us saying, Oh wait, we're wrong about that. Go back and redo it. So it's kind of fun. And a lot of our, a lot of our members really use that. They, they, uh, we did that by popular demand from membership and, People love it. It is extremely popular among our members. We also have member special exclusive.
exclusive content. About once a month, we'll do a special ranging from tech stuff to non-tech stuff. Sometimes we'll, we'll talk about like movies or food or traditions or whatever. Um, and of course, there's tech topics there as well. So lots of great bonus content there as well. You can also now give membership as a gift. It's really close to the end of the holiday season. You know, where if you have like a last minute gift need, give ATP membership as a gift. You can do that as well. All of this is available at atp.fm slash join. And it's about eight bucks a month. We have different payment options, different, you know, intervals and discounts and currencies, but it's about eight bucks a month. So go to atp.fm slash join today. Please check it out. Thank you so much. We are supported exclusively by our members of this episode, so it's really important uh, you know, that we keep that train going, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, atp.fm slash join. Thank you so much for considering it, and let's get back to the show. A lot of stuff happened today. Um, generally speaking, this is a little inside baseball, but generally speaking, the morning that we record ATP, I like to go somewhere else to work. You know, oftentimes it's, you know, the grocery store that I like Wegmans or maybe it'll be a library or something. And I'll sit there and I'll read through all the links and make sure and watch all the videos, make sure I know what the heck it is I'm going to talk about that night. And I typically do that, you know, from like eight, eight in the morning until roughly lunchtime. And then at that point, I consider myself having done the research and job well done, pat on the back for me. Well, all sorts of broke uh, stuff broke today, and so I'm shooting from the hip a little bit at this point, but here we go. And let's start with uh, what happened at something like 9 o'clock in the morning Eastern time. Uh, it was broken, I think, specifically to 9 to 5 Mac, or at least in part to 9 to 5 Mac. But 9 to 5 Mac uh, wrote that Apple is pausing sales of the Apple Watch Series 9 and, and Apple Watch Ultra 2 in the United States due to a patent dispute. And there had been rumblings about this in the past. I don't think we ever talked about it on the show. But in short, there is a company whose name I don't have in front of me, but I believe begins with an M, that has patents on uh, on how to do blood oxygen detection. And they have claimed that Apple is infringing on those patents. And I guess th it's going through the courts, and that's not going as quick as this company wants. So they appealed to some other or, or organization, the International Trade Commission, there you go, that has said, okay, yeah, we agree with you other companies. So we're going to tell Apple they have to pause sales of the devices that infringe on these patents, which is basically the Series 9 and Ultra 2. For now, as we sit here on Monday the 18th, they can still sell them through other retailers. So like Amazon and Best Buy, for example, um, they they can still sell these devices, but it is possible that around Christmas time, they will also not be able to sell these devices. So it's a big mess and I'm surprised it's gotten this far. So I, I don't even know what to make of this. I mean, this is why we really haven't covered it on the show yet. As far as I am concerned is like, there's weird patent claims against companies all the time and then they settle and then it goes nowhere and it's fine. Like someone pays some money and the lawyers make most of it and it's in, you know, like all use of patents, it's just a tax on everybody and it doesn't really protect anybody from anything. Um, and the lawyers make out with all the money, the end. Congratulations, that's the U.S. patent system. Um, so <laughs> a lot of good there, the promoting innovation. Good job, everyone. <laughs> So normally these cases, you know, they, they breeze through the news and they don't go anywhere because they get settled out and you never hear about them again. So when this stuff started with uh, Massimo as the company, when it started, you know, them making claims against the Apple Watch, which I think they've been making claims against the Apple Watch for years now. Again, we just thought, uh, at least I just thought, well, it's going to fizzle out and get settled or something like that's that's what's gonna, yep, going to yep. happen. And that's it. And so to to have us be at the point now where. Apple has announced that like as possibly as early as next week, they might have to stop selling their two flagship models of Apple Watch, leaving only the Apple Watch SE in the current lineup. That's substantially different news than we usually hear like that. That's a big deal. Um, I'm guessing it won't actually get that far or if it does get that far, it will be a fairly brief shutdown of sales. You got to figure like Apple is is pulling out all the stops to try to get this, you know, resolved in some way. Um, but you also know that Apple is I don't think Apple is super willing to give on, you know, threats of patent litigation like this. Like, I don't think they're going to just say, all right, Massimo, here's a whole bunch of money. We're going to license your patents and, and give you whatever you want. Like, I don't see it ending that way necessarily. Uh, what's probably going to happen is they're going to try 
to get around it with some kind of technicality and then there will be more lawsuits and it'll prolong stuff and it'll it'll just kick the can down the road further. That kind of thing can be successful for years. So that's probably what's going to happen here. But in the meantime, if they actually go through with this, because what they, all they said so far is basically that they think they'll have to go through with this. If they actually have to go through with this and actually have to stop selling <laughs> most Apple Watches uh, in the U.S. for a while, whatever that, you know, and it, look, it could be a week. I'm guessing if it happens at all, it's going to be very brief. I, I it, it would surprise me if it was more than a week, uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, stranger stuff has happened, I guess, in tech, but it will kind of be interesting as a, you know, as tech enthusiasts and as a tech podcast, it will be interesting to see if it does happen because this kind of thing pretty much never happens uh, in our world. At least like it, it doesn't make it up to the level of being visible to consumers like this. So this, this could be interesting. Yeah, so the Apple released a statement about this, and you can see a, the glimmer of Apple's potential strategy because you would think Apple's statement about this would be all about how, uh, you know, usually Apple statements are, here's the thing we're doing. So first of all, this one's weird because it says, here's a thing that we might have to do in the future if everything continues the way it's going, which is weird, right? You know, so they're like, but the very first sentence of the statement kind of hints at what they're going for. Uh, it says, this is from Apple's statement. First sentence, a presidential review period is in progress regarding an order from the International Trade Commission, blah, 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 right? So it starts by saying, hey, there's there's a thing that's under review by the president. And if nothing changes and if the review period goes through and we have to do all this stuff, we're going to do these things, right? It's like, you know, what the Apple says, Apple is preemptively taking steps to comply should the ruling stand, Right. So what, what does that even mean? I mean, I guess you could like, well, get ready to stop selling stuff. I, you know, I guess there maybe there's something they need to do. But why issue a statement about, just so you guys know, uh, there is a presidential <laughs> review period. And unless uh, things go our way, unless someone says, changes their mind, we're going to have to stop selling Apple Watch. It's convenient for Apple, by the way, that they have to stop selling them essentially on December 24th and 25th. So they get all their holiday sales, but they mm-hmm. don't really get any post-holiday sales. <laughs> Uh, and of course, you know, Amazon and Best Buy and stuff can sell through their inventory or whatever. Um, so th- the interpretation of the statement is basically Apple announcing to the world slash president saying, you wouldn't want us to stop selling Apple watches, would you? Because it's kind of a popular product and we're kind of a popular company. And if you don't do something, Mr. President, we're going to have to stop selling Apple watches. Doesn't that sound terrible for you? So just we're putting out this public statement I mean, everybody involved knows this, right? But Apple puts out a public statement that says to the world, and, you know, we're talking about it on this podcast, something that everyone involved in this, uh, this you know, issue, the, the review board, the two companies, everyone already knows that. But Apple is kind of putting it out in the world to put pressure on the president to, to you know, overturn this or to, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, they have the ability to this review period of saying, because either you let it stand or you like counteract it in some way. And I think Apple's hoping that the president will say, oh, don't stop Apple from selling the Apple Watch. They're a big, important company and they make a lot of money. Um, I'm not quite sure how the system works. I don't pay too much attention to patent law. I'm not a lawyer. I hate patents with a passion. Um, I'm not sure that gambit is going to work, especially because Apple put out the statement. If Apple wanted to do this, they should be working back channels, not running to the press, because that never helps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can assume they probably have tried that already. Like right, that. but this is like the last ditch thing of like saying, hey, world, we're going to have to stop selling Apple watches for dumb patent reasons. And this kind of is related to uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday's last episode where we're saying that uh, Apple is a U.S. company and they are subject to U.S. laws. And sometimes there are those laws that they don't like, like laws about handing things over to the government, or in this case, patent laws. Apple patents everything because as a big company, they have to. It's a, it's, it's The system we have is you have to participate in it. You don't get to be the size of Apple if you don't patent everything under the sun. A lot of the times you, you're patenting all this bogus stuff is so you can use it as defense against other people using their bogus patents against you. And this war of mutually assured destruction, which is totally pointless and stifles innovation and and the only people it makes happy are lawyers it's terrible but it is the system that we currently have and apple sure as hell participates in that system it's kind of you know a bummer for apple in this case it seems like they don't have enough patents to retaliate against massimo and massimo is playing hardball and it's not being bought off at, at the price apple thinks is reasonable so it's a game of chicken now it's like 
Do you, do you, people and the government of the U.S., really want Apple to stop selling its two flagship Apple Watches indefinitely because of some company you've never heard of with some super dumb patent? You don't want that to happen, do you? And Apple is not currently lobbying for reforming patent law, and I'm not sure if they even would because, again, Apple participates so much in the system that it's hard to know whether they like it or not. But they have to participate in the system. It would be great if they lobbied for, you know, reform on software patents and reform on patents in general, but that is an uphill battle with lots of forces going in the other direction. And it doesn't seem like Apple has much appetite for that. So here we are. They're just out there saying, I know we have a stupid system and we tried to settle our way out of this. Uh, now we're doing making a last ditch sort of plea to the anyone who can overturn this to say, how about just let's not do it in this case? <laughs> and I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> I One thing I, I think is for pretty sure, Apple will not stop selling its flagship Apple Watches for very long. I mean, worst case scenario, Apple just buys the company. Like Apple like Apple can solve this problem with money. They just don't want to. Right? Yeah. They don't want whatever Massimo wants, they don't want to pay it. But believe me, Apple can pay it. <laughs> whatever the amount <laughs> is, Apple can pay it and will eventually pay it if this goes on long enough. So Massimo is, you know, betting that they can just drag this out to get a little bit more money. But in the end, Apple's not going to spend a year not selling its two flagship Apple Watches. They're going to pay whatever it takes to make this go away eventually, but they're going to try everything else first. And this is one of those things. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, that's the racket of patents. It's it's just extortion. I mean, that's like, that's, again, pr- promoting innovation with patents. What you're really doing is, you know, creating legal methods of extortion. Um, and, and that's, again, it's one of the many reasons. It, 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 and it makes it so that only the richest companies can even participate because it's impossible, as we've discussed in the past shows, it's impossible to make any technology product without infringing tons and tons of patents that you can't afford to license. Like that is not, you know, the purpose of the patents is supposed to be for whatever the whatever the quote is from the relevant law of like the the encouragement of the whatever arts or whatever. And it does the exact Useful. opposite. It makes it it makes it so the only way that you as a small company can have a tech product is if you get lucky and hide. Because it, and, and the big companies violate so many patents, but they also acquire tons of patents to retaliate against and against anyone. And then you have patent trolls who are like, ha, we don't make anything, so you can't retaliate against us. And it's just <laughs> it is the worst system. And here we have, hopefully this will motivate some patent reform or maybe give Apple an appetite for it. Because again, Apple participates so heavily in the system that I can imagine within Apple, there are sections of the company that think, oh, patents are great. We just, you know, our patents are super important. Remember when Steve Jobs was up there with the iPhone? Oh boy, have we patented it, right? They always sound great when you're on the side of like using your patents to beat mm-hmm. down other people. It's not so great when it goes in the other direction. The whole point and look is- at how well that worked for them. Like it didn't even work that well for them in the end No, of it the doesn't day. work. It'll never work. It's because everything is stupid and everyone... All the big companies acquire tons of these really dumb <laughs> patents, and they make it like Apple licensed the one-click patent. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Amazon had have an Amazon for kids who don't know Apple uh, Amazon.com, the place that used to sell books online and now sells everything. Uh, patented the ability to buy something with a single click. Yep. Which, if that sounds dumb to you, welcome to patents. Uh, and I believe <laughs> Apple licensed it for like for the <laughs> iTunes Store or whatever, right? Because that's the way it works. It's like. How many dumb patents do you have? How many dumb patents? That's why patent cross-licensing agreements happen. Like, I think Apple did a big cross-licensing agreement with Microsoft. It's like, look, we have tons of dumb patents, and so do you. How about we just agree that I can use all your patents and you can use all of mine? So at least we can ignore each other and just worry about the other people who are constantly suing us for patents and stuff. Um, and we don't have time for an entire show about why <laughs> patents are dumb. I'm sure people disagree with us see many past episodes where this has been discussed, including a couple on my old hypercritical podcast. Our position has not changed since then. Uh, and especially, uh, I think the entire Apple ecosystem got a taste of it with the, what was the, the the round that came through and swiped a bunch of developers we know? Some stupid thing about audio playing or something? Oh, they, well, that was a different one. That was um, something like home, or was something home audio, something like that. That, that was, the EFF struck that one down, I think. Um, no, Lodsys was... It was some kind of, I think it was an, an in-app purchase thing. I forget what the details were. I, thank God it actually never hit me, but it hit a bunch of people close to me, like a whole, a whole bunch of people you you all know. And, yeah, and, the, and the small developers like had to pay for it. And it really is like extortion because they, 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 they come to you and they say, look, we can destroy your company with this. So uh, pay us all the money you can afford to pay us because they want to get money. They don't want to destroy the company because they destroy a the company to get nothing. So they basically say, how much can you afford to pay us? Like, how much money do you have in your wallet? Just give us all of that, right? And so for smaller developers who don't have a lot of their money, they'll say, okay, well, just tell us how much is in your bank account, and we won't charge you any more than that. That's the shakedown <laughs> of these things. Like, for the big company, obviously, they can't do it with Apple because Apple has billions of dollars. They're not going to get all of that, right? Right. 
But for the small developers, it's not like there's a flat fee, like everyone has to pay $2 million. No, because they know no small developers can pay that. But if you're a small individual developer, they still want your money. So like, can you pay us 30000 you know, and, and people would do it just to make, but you can't afford to fight it. Yeah, because the alternative is like, all right, then you can try to hire a lawyer for $100,000. Like, that's, that's the, that, that's, again, it's extortion. It, it's just the mob, but legal. Like, it's, it's exactly like, you know, hey, it'd be a shame if that building burned down, you pay us for protection money. It's that. It's just that, but legal. Like, that's why, I mean, the patent, it's so, <laughs> now we're getting all mad, but like, that, it is so dysfunctional and practical. It's one of those, it's one of those wonderful stories that we tell people, like, oh, yeah, well, th- there's, you can be, an individual inventor in your garage and come up with a great million dollar idea and patent it and the reality is so far from that that is not how it works at all like the the only people who have patents are fools and assholes that's it because to get a patent if you are an individual to get a patent that is actually like properly written properly filed and has any chance of at all maybe being enforceable it costs tens of thousands of dollars just to file a patent like that. So how many individual inventors in their garage are going to have tens of thousands of dollars to pay a lawyer and file everything and get it all written up and get it done? And then once you actually, if you actually get that patent granted to you, that doesn't prevent everyone from using it. That just gives you a tool that you can use to sue people who use it. Guess what? That takes more money. So the only people who can actually get a patent and then afford to try to enforce it against somebody are people with tons of money already, and chances are it won't really stop a big company from stealing the idea and using it because big companies, guess what they have? More money and more lawyers and more time than you. And I know this is kind of making the case for Massimo, but but like, but that's the reality. So like, if you are a small inventor and you think a patent is going to protect you, it won't. It just will cost you tons of money. And then at the end of the day, it still won't protect you. So that's the fool side of it. And then there's the asshole side of it. It's people who, who you know, actually intend to, you know, deploy this thing against unsuspecting people. Because here's the thing, like, patents are allegedly required to be novel and to be not some kind of solution that a lay person would have would have just kind of come up with on their own in the field. So this is this is the argument against many software patents is like many people end up allegedly violating patents accidentally because the thing that is patented just became kind of common sense to anybody who is in that field. Like, so if you're writing a, an app and you you have a certain problem you're trying to solve you know, with some algorithm or some technique, you might just come up with that on your own. The reality is that's how most invention works and simultaneous invention is a real thing and kind of destroys the whole myth the patent system is based on. But anyway, uh, setting all that aside for, for, the, for the moment, um, most patent infringement in most of tech is done accidentally and unknowingly because so much has patent is has been patented by people who are just opportunistic thieves who and vultures who who want to be parasites on the world and want to shake people down for money because they're because they think well I I'm going to stake out my claim and get get these patents and these things and then everyone has to pay me when they do them there are many ways to to go through this life and I try very very hard to be the total opposite of that kind of asshole uh, and I hope most of you out there make the same choice. Anyway, so the patent system doesn't work the way anyone thinks it does. The only people who benefit are lawyers and giant companies. And here's a patent fight that is, you know, between two giant companies who, you know, are both trying to extract as much money out of the other as possible. And these, these views that I hold on patents and that John holds on patents are, are not super rare views uh, in the tech business, especially most of, most of the tech business doesn't like patents. And so there is, there is no way that Apple is going to be amenable to any solution that requires them to pay Massimo for every Apple watch they make, which is probably what Massimo is asking them to do. And probably a lot because Apple doesn't want to be stuck with that forever. Patents last a very long time. I believe it's something like 20 or 30 years, depending on whatever it's in. Um, Patents last a long time. So Apple does not want to be paying this company for every single Apple watch they make some dollar amount for an idea that Apple thinks they don't deserve to have exclusivity on. Apple is very, very principled. We know that. We saw how hard they fought against Epic, which I'm, maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. But we saw like the, the principled stand they take about protecting what they believe is theirs in the App Store and the taxes they charge to developers in the App Store and the gatekeeper fees they charge. Like, they, they feel so strongly that 
you know, to a lot of times to Apple, you know, they're a very uh, opinionated company, a very principled company, and usually that is a very good thing. You know, with stuff like this, they're not going to just say, "Fine, we'll give you five bucks per Apple Watch or whatever." They're not going to say that <laughs> because they are probably so mad that this company even thinks they deserve five bucks from each Apple Watch because Apple probably thinks. They they invented this stuff, or this stuff is common sense, or it shouldn't have been patented, or whatever. Because again, that's how patents work; they're all BS. So I don't see Apple like being necessarily willing to solve this problem with money. If the solution with money involves, we'll give you five bucks for every Apple Watch we sell for the next fifteen years. No, they, they would never do that. They would just buy. They would just buy the company at that point. Maybe, but then, but what? What does the company want them to pay? Like, because Apple probably hates this company, and they would they they would rather probably bury this company in in lawsuits for years than to actually buy them. Like, because they're again, they're a principled company. I mean, I, I'm saying buy the company jokingly because they wouldn't actually sell, and Apple wouldn't offer to, to buy them. But what I'm saying is that money can solve this problem in many ways. Oh, it can. No way, but they won't. There's no way they would sign up for that protection racket where where they would pay that. You know, if they license the patent, they would do it the way they license all their patents, which is like, we just want to be done with you. We never want to see you again. <laughs> kind of like what they did with ARM. Not that it's adversarial, but like getting the architecture license. Whatever that license is, it seems like they can now can do what they want with ARM without worrying about that anymore. Same thing with the cross-license patent agreements. Like They just want this to be over and go away. And for whatever reason, Massimo's playing hardball and they haven't agreed on a price. But I feel like they have to because there, there's no way they're going to stop selling the Apple Watch, right? They're going to figure it out. I mean, not for a long time. I mean, maybe they'll do it for a week or a month or whatever to put political pressure on. But they're not going to forego an entire year worth of Apple Watch Ultra sales. So, what do you think about patents, gentlemen? Not a fan. Not a big fan. No. All right. Uh, I think we have time to keep on keeping on, so let's talk about the next breaking piece of news from earlier today. Adobe is giving up on their $20 billion with a bu- 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 b uh, dollar acquisition of Figma. They, The two of them have decided that there is no chance this is going to get through regulators in the UK and the US. So the heck with it. We're going to part ways. Oh, and apparently Adobe owes Figma a billion dollars in termination fees. Whoopsie doopsies. Uh, I can't say this is terribly surprising to me. And, and I, I honestly don't know a whole bunch about um, either company because I've never really used Adobe stuff and I've never had the occasion to use Figma. You've never used Adobe stuff? Not really. Not, not in any regularity. I never touched photoshop with any, about acrobat any back in your pc days. oh okay well that's fair i didn't think about that yeah that's true um but anyways yeah so apparently they're breaking up and a uh, billion dollars to figma you know you may pass go and you may collect a billion dollars it seems so weird that they had such a big breakup fee in what yeah. would always look like a risky thing because adobe despite casey not using it is a pretty well-known uh, company with a couple of products you might have heard of like photoshop <laughs> they are the big dog in the in the markets that they participate in Adobe has gobbled up a bunch of its competitors in the past, either gobbled up or defeated or both its competitors being the bigger and bigger dog. And Figma was the first company in a long time to start giving Adobe a run for its money. So Adobe trying to acquire them, you have to, you know, everyone involved has to know, boy, this might be tough to get past regulators because in general, if a company like Adobe started out as, you know, being an important, uh, you know, company in their market, and just grew and grew and ate their competitors and grew and ate and defeated their competitors and grew and ate and defeated their competitors and then wants to buy some uh, the the one company that has challenged them in ages for twenty billion. You're going to look askance at that and say this probably doesn't seem like it would uh, make for a healthier market. And so they put a one billion dollar breakup fee in there. Uh, and as Daniel Jock had pointed out uh, earlier today, like if, I think Figma has like a thousand employees, so that one billion dollar breakup <laughs> fee. In theory, you could give a million dollars to every figure employee, which of course is not what's going to happen, right? Because that's not how capitalism works. But like, can you uh, imagine uh, though? That would it's be a- unreal. Like, I know it will never happen. I'm not arguing it will never happen. But can you imagine if any one of these, what did you say, thousand people, rank and yeah, file thousand, employees? Thousand employees yeah. Can you imagine if just you, you know, they snap their fingers Thanos style, but then all of a sudden everyone's a billionaire? Excuse me, a millionaire? That would be unreal what a cool story that would be unfortunately it'll never happen i mean i think they all stood to make a lot more in their adobe stock or whatever they're going to get as part of the deal so this is but you know obviously yeah all this money is going to go a few people are going to make a lot of money with this breakup fee and most of the employees are going to make nothing i would assume uh because that's the way capitalism works but yeah that's a big breakup fee for a deal that if you had to place odds on it would be difficult to know which side to bet 
I'm glad they went against not knowing the details, but my general inclination is competition is good and a the, the market that Adobe's in needs more competition, not less. And I have used Adobe and I have used Figma. And I do see how they compete with each other. They also are slightly complementary because they come at things in a different way. And the places where Adobe is strong is not where Figma is strong. But the whole point is people were using Figma instead of the equivalent or, you know, non-equivalent, non-existing Adobe tools. And that's why the the market was shifting a little bit. It was like, hey, Figma has something that Adobe doesn't. It's a competition. They weren't making a Photoshop replacement that was better than Photoshop. They were coming at it from a different angle, really focusing on collaboration and focusing on the use cases that for the modern world that were, you know, lots of Adobe products were created before the web existed. <laughs> so that really colors their, uh, their lineage and their feature set. And Figma is totally focused on a, you know, world where we're all connected and collaborating on things. So, yeah, my my uh, instinctual inclination when any of these huge mergers come is let's not do that. Uh, let's just let them go on their own. And, and Figma is not – I think Figma can exist on its own. People are like, well, who's going to buy Figma now? <sighs> I don't like the idea that the only reason a company exists is to get bought by a larger company. I know that's a big thing, and there's some, there's some hemming and hawing about this. Like, oh, if they don't let this deal come through, how are startups going to get funded? Because the only way startups get funded is they assume they'll eventually get bought by the bigger company. It's like, that's not healthy. If the whole purpose of making a startup <laughs> is to be eventually be acquired by the bigger company, all you do is feeding people and ideas into the bigger company that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. You can actually make a competing company that makes a profit and pays employees and makes a product and improves it. Like lots of the companies that are around today started that way. Right? If they weren't like every, every single company that we talk about on the show would all be owned by IBM or something. And there'd just be one company that's called IBM and it owns the former Microsoft and it owns the former Apple and it owns the former Atari and it owns the former everybody. Cause they just buy everything. Like, Hey, what's wrong with that? I feel like that's the current environment. Which is <laughs> I like, bet they would make really great products. <laughs> yeah. Which is like the, uh, like whatever the big companies are that exist now, it's like, well, no other companies can exist except for these ones. And from now on, the only thing you can do is make a startup that you hope will be acquired by one of them. I think the last big one that appeared, I would assume we would say like Facebook and Google were the last two big ones to appear. And now it's like, this is it. This is the set. Uh, and your company is just going to get acquired by this, the stupid uh, you know abbreviations they have for it. I forget what it is, like FAMP or whatever. It was like, you know. Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, you know, Adobe, like just like there's just there's these big companies in each of their markets that are so dominant, they stop them from buying everybody, right? And if Figma can't make it on its own, it's like, oh, well, we invested so much money. The only reason we've been able to make this good product is because we, we, we're not viable as a standalone business. Our only purpose is to be acquired. Well, that's a bad business plan. Don't do that. <laughs> Being acquired, fine. Maybe that can happen. That's that's a fine way to exit for certain companies. But if you grow to the size of Figma, where where the biggest company wants to buy you for twenty billion, you probably have a viable business on your own. At least I hope you do. You've got a thousand employees. Someone wants to buy you for twenty billion. You can't make money. You can't figure out how to be a profitable standalone company. You have to be acquired, or is it because your investors are like, well, the only way we get our big paydays if you get acquired? Ugh, it's more more uh, distasteful side effects of our economic system so i don't again i'm not being gleeful saying oh, because they get these figma employees you know that th they're working within the system we have and part of the system we have is one of the big payoffs you might get from working at this company is you might get acquired and you might make out like a bandit right uh and i just I don't begrudge them that i don't i think they they deserve that as much as anyone deserves anything but it's another example of working within a system that i think is bad and we all have to work within it because it's a system that we have but i really wish we would work to change that system and part of the system like it or not are regulators that sometimes say that a big company can't buy some other company and in this case it was the uk and the eu instead of the us but you know that's that's also part of the system it's also part of the risk of being an employee and hoping you're going to get bought out by a bigger company uh that merger may be stopped by regulators and in this case i'm not sad that it was stopped all right, and then the last piece of breaking news from earlier today is that data from test flight servers from 2012 to 2015. So this is this is before Apple certainly took ownership. I think it was before Apple even said they were going to buy Test Flight or or but it was before all that happened, I believe. Yeah, Test Flight used to be a a separate company, like a little startup. Mm -hmm. It was it was much more limited and much harder to use, but it was pretty useful at the time. 
Yeah, definitely. Very well put. Anyways, there's a bunch of data that maybe has been leaked. I'm not sure that leak is really the right classification here. And maybe Uncovered. we'll figure about that in a second. Uh, Uncover might be a better word for it. Thank you. But anyways, a bunch of data, like terabytes worth of data has has been exposed or uncovered, uh, like Marco had said, from, ser- from test flight servers back in the 2012 to 2015 era. And so... Uh, we're not entirely sure how this came to be. We're not even entirely sure if this was recent, but certainly it's become a bit of a brouhaha over the, over the last 24 hours. Uh, yeah, a lot of old builds, a lot of old data coming to light. It appears that this may relate to uh, Amazon S3 buckets that were not pro- properly protected. Maybe. That's the, that's the fourth hard problem in computer science, uh, <laughs> is protect, cor- properly protecting <laughs> S3 buckets, right? Right. Um, I think that the deal with this, again, this story just broke this morning. I think the deal with this is that this data dump has existed for like a decade and people are just rediscovering it because people have short memories. Um, and it's like, it's in archive.org, right? Uh, regardless of when this leaked, how old the leak it is, how, how much we forgot about it and are rediscovering it 10 years later because we all have short memories. It's not great. <laughs> it's out there, right? Yeah. It's not the source code for these things. It's binary. So what you upload to test flight is, is a, uh, you know, a build of your app that you're testing on people's devices. It's not the final one probably that you're going to send to the app store. Maybe, you know, it might be if you, if they decide that build works, but it's all the in-between builds that you send. And so they're binaries or maybe in some cases, bit code if Apple watch was around back then, um, for tons of stuff. And people are sort of digging through this giant archive of binaries, trying to see if there's anything useful. Uh, the link we'll put in the show notes is from Eurogamer. It's because it's like, look at these prototypes of games that never shipped because, you know, they they developed them. They put them out on test flight. They decided they're never going to ship them. So if you want to find some weird unreleased game, including some unreleased Flappy Bird variant, because that's what people at Eurogamer are excited about, I guess, uh, you could dig th- through this. But this is the difficulty of, uh, you know, le- leaving stuff unprotected on the Internet. And when it makes it its way into archive.org, Apparently, it's hard to get rid of it, even 10 years later, if this really is a leak from, or, or a, people say it's not a leak, it's, it was, they just crawled it. But either way, it, it, uh, Test Flight didn't intend for this to be in archive.org, and yet it is in archive.org, because archive.org crawled the Test Flight site and followed links and eventually found all this stuff and slurped it all up, and now it's there. It would be great if Apple slash Test Flight could say, hey, archive.org. Can you remove all that? Because uh, we don't own all that intellectual property and neither do you. So it probably shouldn't be in archive.org because it's basically it's builds of. Uh, did you use test flight in that year range? Did you upload an app? Your app is probably in this this data dump, right? Uh, and you probably don't want it there. I mean, maybe it's irrelevant. Maybe you don't care. Maybe it's a build of an app that's long dead or it's useless to everybody because it only runs on all the OSs or whatever. It's 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 weird, but it's also a cautionary tale. Check your S3 bucket permissions. <laughs> and this sounds dumb, but like if you like Amazon doesn't make this that easy and they've worked on it over the years to try to make it more obvious when you screw this up. There are whole companies that part of their product is that they will go over your stuff in AWS and make sure you haven't done something boneheaded. And yet it happens all the time. Someone has an S3 bucket, which for people don't know, it's just a place on the internet where you can store files. There's lots of imitators. Um, and they accidentally make it accessible to everybody. And it's like, how would they not notice this? You don't notice it because you can't really get anything out of it unless you sort of know the file name. So it's security through obscurity, especially if they don't allow it, uh, like essentially directory listing to use web parlance. Like you can't, it, you know, you can set the permission. So, oh, nobody can iterate over the contents. You can't list what's here. But if you know the file name, you can make a request for it and you'll get it, right? And the file names are really big and obscure. And it's like, well, you know, you wouldn't notice that it's publicly accessible because no one would be making those requests. But if you have a crawler, and especially if that crawler is seeded with like, it knows that you use like the app ID as the file name and it has a bunch of app IDs from elsewhere, then the crawler can just go through and try all those app IDs. The whole point is your S3 bucket shouldn't be publicly accessible. It shouldn't, at some, random person on the internet should not be able to pull a file from it if it's not supposed to be publicly accessible. There should be some authentication where you have to be allowed to get that file, like because you're the developer of the file and that's how you can get it. But doing that can be a little bit annoying. And especially with the efficiencies of S3 where you really don't want them to go through your server or to bounce off your server. You want them to go directly to S3 because that's one of the wonderful things about S3 is that it's available everywhere and it's close by and blah, blah, blah. People uh, take a shortcut and they say, well, no one's going to guess this URL anyway. 
we'll just make the bucket publicly accessible. Or they accidentally make it publicly accessible, but again, they never realize it's publicly accessible because it seems like you can't get anything from it without knowing how to get to it. But especially com automated computer crawlers, they'll just follow links. They don't know which ones they're quote unquote supposed to or not supposed to follow. So if they find it in, they'll just go and crawl and scrape and pull everything out of there and it ends up in archive.org. I mean, in all fairness, um, if you set up a new S3 bucket today, they make you jump through many hoops to make it publicly accessible. Like they, they've like Amazon has learned like, wow, people mess this up a lot. Uh, yep. You know, so they like you have to. It is now so complicated and convoluted to make any part of an S three bucket publicly accessible. So the, it it's better now. Well, people are motivated to do it because like my app's not working. I keep getting an error on S three, and they're like they just bash AWS until this, the error stops. Like oh done now the errors don't. I'm not sure what I did, but now I'm not getting any more errors pulling from S three. So I guess everything's fine. And then you know fast forward ten years, and someone has scraped everything out of their bucket, and it's an archive.org. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, we are supported exclusively this episode by ATP members. Please consider becoming a member today at atp.fm slash join. So to recap, here's what you get. You get the ad-free version of the show in a special RSS feed that you can add to any podcast app that you want that supports RSS feeds, which is most of them. Uh, you also get access to a bootleg feed. This is the unedited, raw live stream that's broadcast for the show, including extra stuff before and after what's you released, including things like our title selection process and occasional little bits that don't make it into the final edit of the show. Plus, you hear Casey swearing, you hear me miss some jokes, you hear like whatever flubs are kind of natural uh, to the live show, and you get it a about half a day before the episode is released, so you get it early. So that's a very, very popular option among our members, that bootleg feed. And of course, you get member specials, exclusive content released about once a month that can span from tech topics like, you know, our, our CMS development, John learning PHP, stuff like that, to more kind of, you know, squishy topics, things like movies we like or food we're trying. It's a lot of fun. That's the member specials. So you also get a, mem a merchandise discount. So whenever we offer the ATP store, whenever we have those time ranged sales that we bother you about in the main show. You, usually members will get a special code that will apply to everything in that sale that will give them 15% off. So it's a net little extra bonus uh, it, with membership there. So anyway, check it out, atp.fm slash join. It's about eight bucks a month, and it is the best way to support the show. You know, the ad market goes up and down. That's life, you know, but members are there. They are consistent, and they have really helped us out a lot this last year. You know, as the ad market has been <laughs> not so great. Uh, so thank you so much to members who are out there. For some reason, if you're hearing this, um, <laughs> if you're not, uh, please consider becoming a member today. ATP.FM slash join. Thank you so much for your consideration. And back to the show. All right, let's do some Ask ATP. And Tom Bullock writes, what's the best way in 2023 to run an old version of OS X, for example, Tiger? I I don't know, to be honest with you. I know that Apple has a a bit of sample code, and I think Guy Rambo might have put something together where you can like use whatever the hypervisor Virtual, is. Yeah, virtualization framework. Yeah, yeah. And you can very, very cheaply and reasonably easily uh, create and run a virtual machine. I dabbled with this briefly like six months or a year ago, and it was pretty good. I would assume that the right answer is something like VM VMware Fusion or Parallels, but I honestly don't know. I, I think, John, you might be the best person to answer this question. Best is the trickiest part here. Yeah, best for what? What is the what is the best way in 2023? Well, getting back to our discussion about Palm devices, mm -hmm. <laughs> the best way is to use an old Mac because <laughs> that will give you the authentic experience of what it was really like for that definition if that's your definition of best that's going to be the best you need like a crt you need a, a blue and white g3 you know you need that's good that's that's one definition of best but i'm assuming that's not what this person wants to know um people want to run it without getting an old computer or dealing with all of that hassle here's the problem though all of the virtualization stuff that apple offers so far doesn't let you sign into an Apple ID, which maybe back in Tiger isn't that big of a deal, but as the versions advance, not being able to sign into an Apple ID puts really cramps your ability to do stuff with it. Like if you want, if you're there because you, I want to try all the old apps and see how they work, and it's like, oh, I can't do this because I have to sign into an Apple ID or I can't use this sync thing or whatever. If you don't care about that, then yeah, 
any virtualization thing will work there. The reason people have made these uh, virtualization apps is because Apple has a framework for virtualization. And if you can put a fairly thin app wrapper around that, the framework does all the virtualization stuff. You just have to deal with like making a nice UI, letting people set things up and install or whatever, right? So that's why you see a lot of these hanging around. VMware, I think, still uses its own virtualization framework from way back in the day. That will probably be more straightforward and more supported. Even with VMware, there are limitations. I, I have VMware and I have old versions of Mac OS X here hanging around for some old software and some curiosity. And it's not not everything works. Like if you expect it to be just like if you had pulled out that old Mac, it's not going to be. I'm not sure if it has the same app ID and limitations, but definitely the graphics acceleration, especially on old versions, super jank. It either doesn't exist at all or it exists, but it doesn't work the way you expect it to, or it seems slow. And if if you like, sometimes they're all, they all look like they're in safe mode where there's like no transparency and everything's really slow. And you have to figure out how to enable the GPU acceleration. It's not straightforward. So the reason I mentioned the hardware thing is that really is the best. You'll get as much as you can possibly get. And even then, uh, referencing what Marco was talking about uh, last episode, there may be issues with, uh, you know, TLS and SSL versions, which mean that you can't use the web browsers. You know, you, like you, you won't be able to really use it like it was back in the day because the world has moved on. But the closest you can get is with hardware. Everything else is going to be in compromise. So it really depends on what specifically you want to do. If you just want to run sp some specific app and it doesn't need your Apple ID, and doesn't need to do any weird networking that's not going to work because of TLS upgrades, then yeah, any VM solution will work. I liked VMware. I still use it. I think they're going into a subscription model soon. So if you want to get the last sort of licensed version that you can buy and use until it breaks, uh, run and get a VMware Fusion now. Uh, or otherwise, look at all of the various virtualization projects, but realize you're always going to be taking some kind of hit in functionality, which is a shame. Until, fast forward a decade or two, Kind of like we run uh, classic Mac OS, you'll be able to run Tiger in like a web browser using some JavaScript thing, right? But we're not there yet. <laughs> also, I mean, do the, the virtualization um, apps, to the best of my knowledge, none of them will provide architecture emulation, right? So like the idea is like, you know, for, for an old enough version of Mac OS, uh, if, you're, if you are, say, you know, running on a Apple Silicon MacBook Pro or whatever, you're not going to be able to run something that could only run on Intel or PowerPC. So you're going to need something that can emulate those processors and in addition to virtualization of the underlying OS. And I don't... Yeah, I was trying, I was trying to think of VMware would do that for you. Does anything do sure. that on Apple Silicon? I don't, I don't think we have that yet. I could be wrong. Um, but m most of the big solutions, including anything that uses Apple's uh, virtualization framework, they don't virtualize x86 emulation on apple silicon max so any so you can't run an intel os using apple's virtualization framework on apple silicon yeah yeah so v vmware is i mean i'm i guess i'm still stuck in the intel world thinking all oh, you know, vmware will just run natively on your intel thing but if you don't have an intel mac yeah and the virtualization thing is not exists for intel max it's an arm only thing but that doesn't stop you there's tons of before apple came up with their virtualization framework there, there are free ones. What is the VirtualBox is another free one. And there's one other free one I'm forgetting. VMware is just a fancy. Oh, there's Parallels, which is another uh, commercial one. But like, like I said, like the, all those options have some, I've used all of them at one point or another on Intel Macs, and they all have weirdness about them. Every single one. There's no one of them that's going to be like running it on hardware. Yeah, licensing is weird too. Like a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the old OSs, you legally aren't supposed to virtualize them or aren't allowed to virtualize them, or you have to like find some pirated installer or whatever. Yeah, that could be you know both a pain in the butt and you know not entirely legal if you need that for like some kind of you know compliance reason. So again, like old hardware, as John said, the the only the only um, major downside of old hardware besides like having to have this physical thing that you're running, uh, which can be you know physically cumbersome um it, I, I i wouldn't say it's expensive it's not because old old pc hardware is very inexpensive because nobody wants it um but uh it, it can be a pain in the butt to like get stuff on and off of it like you know the, the advantage of virtualizing on your own computer is that usually the virtualization uh intermediate software will have some convenient ways to like share files back and forth between the two between like your your computer and the, the emulated computer or whatever um when you're dealing with physical hardware 
it becomes a lot more manual of a process. You have to do things like, uh, you know, maybe transfer stuff with USB drives and deal with, you know, the the realities of the of, of that situation and stuff like that. Networking can, as John said, networking can be tricky, especially if it involves any kind of modern security requirements like browsing the web at all can be very difficult uh, on old computers. Um, so it, it is a bit of a pain in the butt to, um, you know, to kind of integrate an old computer into your environment for whatever reason you need to be running it uh, but you you kind of save a whole bunch of possible butt pains by not dealing with virtualization <laughs> or emulation or anything like that so it, you're, you're kind of trading some butt pain for different butt pain yeah well, i mean it's not like a classic mac os it's like anything that can run mac os 10 has usb right and so thumb drives that'll like the you can an hfs plus thumb drive will work in and even you run mac os 10 it'll also run in any modern mac so it's way better than classic where you're like what the hell is this apple talk thing and how do i how do yeah, i deal with that true. Right? or like you have to install an extension to get tcp ip and you know you got to figure out how to connect to the internet yeah. yeah or you have to figure out like floppy disk formats somehow like, yeah. good luck <laughs> yeah get a usb floppy drive plug it into your mac see how that works <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Rankari Anand writes. I was looking at the current set of EVs, and they all seem very unappealing for one reason or another. So I decided to put together a list of my requirements. I will read these. This is a lot, <laughs> and uh, I don't think you should be surprised that you can't find anything that fits all of these. But anyway, the requirements are as follows: no full glass roof, a sunroof that can open, physical button HVAC controls while you're out. At this point, you might as well <laughs> give up. Uh, physical buttons for or lever for the gear selector, and no motorized controls for the gear selector. I'm not sure what that means, but I'll go with it. Uh, physical button seat adjustment controls, radar adaptive cruise control, CarPlay. Preferably have a speedometer in front of the driver, not in a center screen, and the center screen must not be safety critical. In other words, the car should be fully operational, even if the center screen dies. How is this the future? How is this the future that we have built ourselves? I mean, first of all, this all sounds very reasonable in theory, but second of all, like even even if you just say not even just EVs, what new cars satisfy this? Not that many of them, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the new the new Golf R, for example, which I know is, I, I believe, no, it's the manual transmission that's dying. But anyways, the new Golf R doesn't meet all of these, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, it's, it's tough to find a car that would, would meet all these, you know, even not an EV, but especially an EV. Uh, the reason I put this in here is because, well, we'll get to his final question is, what requirements do you have for your next cars? You can have a list like this, but you've kind of got to sort it by priority. And decide where you're going to accept because you're never going to get all of them. Like I think I'm pretty sure there are if there's any car that satisfies all these, you don't want it. Right? <laughs> it's probably not a good car. It's probably a car that you because you didn't list things like how many people fit in it. Yeah, <laughs> like, I feel like that is a bigger requirement. Do you need to fit six people or do you need two? There, like, if we say, okay, we got right. a car that you fits need this. a lot of space for luggage. Yeah, yeah. we got a car that fits this, but it has a, a driver's seat, a passenger seat, and no back seat of any kind. Does that work for you? Like, it's like, no, I've got five people in my family, right? That should probably be a higher priority than no full glass roof. I'm just saying. So you've got to prioritize. But th the reason I think this is a fascinating question, there was a story we had that's probably buried in the show notes. Maybe we'll come up again at some point um, about how uh, customer satisfaction with their new cars has been declining, mostly uh, blaming infotainment. Uh, and we've talked about this in the past, how everyone who's making an electric vehicle feels the need to do stupid things <laughs> that are appealing in the showroom, but that people hate once they get the car home. And I was hoping that would be like, Something that would only happen in the beginning of the age of EVs, like we've talked about, you know, how and why it was probably a good idea for Tesla to do these things in the beginning because you want the car to seem cool and futury. But we're well past that now. EVs are not entirely mainstream, but the only things keeping them out of the mainstream is their price, right? They are they are not exotic and weird. I see EVs all the time. Most of the other ones I see are not Teslas. It is so. There's no reason that every single company that makes an EV needs to do this. But they do do it, and I think the reason they do it is like, well, EVs aren't new, but this is our first EV. It's like, I don't care if it's your first EV. EVs have been out for, what, a decade or whatever? Like, they're very common now. I know you're super proud of your first EV, but think twice before you, for example, decide to make the door handles crappy. Every single EV company is doing that. We've got an EV. The door handles better be annoying and harder to use and break more often. Why? Because EV. 
And if you say anything about aerodynamics, I will hit you with my little cartoon hammer and say, no, no, that's not why you're doing this. Admit it. You can make flush door handles that are not stupid. (laughs) <laughs> but but they don't they make them all stupid it's like it's okay for tesla to do that only tesla tesla's the only company that gets a buy to do that because they were first and they had to be cool and computery and that's their brand that shouldn't be your brand <laughs> volkswagen just make door handles that work people just want to pull the handle and open the door and they want that to happen every time and it would be nice if it still worked when it was like an ice storm or something Stop making them electronic. Stop making them stupid. Same thing goes for everything else inside the car with the HVAC controls. Oh, you want to address your side view mirrors? Have fun navigating the touchscreen. No, stop it. (laughs) Removing stalks from the steering wheel? Stop all of that. But people who are making EVs are doing this. And the la- it's kind of like the Apple Silicon things, like how many years does it take from conception to the shipping of things, like seven years or whatever, right? The cars that we're seeing now, what I hope is that every one of these car companies has learned, A, no more piano black plastic, and B, stop putting everything on screens. But the problem is there's a countervailing force here because the countervailing force is part of the reason that Tesla continues to do this. It's cheaper to put them on the screens. Mm-hmm. And so despite how much people hate them, it's basically like, look, if we all do this, if we all make our cars worse, what are they going to do? They're not going to go to a competitor. So let's all just do it. Let's all reap the savings. Let's just have one screen and no buttons. And it sucks for everybody. But if all cars are like this, we'll be fine. And it's not that all cars are like this, but EVs, among EVs, there is a lot of sameness. Outside of EVs, there are still a few companies that now are bragging in their press things, saying, if you'll notice, we have physical controls for HVAC. Right. And that, that's a selling point to them. They're using it as a selling point. Can you imagine in our childhood of saying, so you're telling me you have buttons to change the fan speed. That's great. That's, <laughs> is that a bullet point in your brochure? Because every car has that. It's like, well, in the, in the dark future, not every car will have that and we'll make you use a touchscreen. Oh, and the, the other thing I'll throw in, under the bus is because like and Mercedes is doing stuff like this thing we complained about before. Um, Oh, don't worry. We don't have touch controls. That would be, uh, that's not good. We need physical feedback. So what we have instead is like on the steering wheel, instead of having touch controls, because you'll swipe those accidentally and you'll activate stuff. No, our things, our buttons, you press them and they physically move in. It's not even haptic. They physically move in and out. But what they do is they make a giant piano black plastic panel with six glyphs on it for six different functions. And when you press any one of those buttons, the entire panel moves in with a creak and a plastic creak and some tilt Mm -hmm. and the entire panel moves out rather than making six individual buttons is essentially one big button with capacitive sensors to know where on the big giant button your finger was when you pressed it and they think this is better than making six buttons but (laughs) land rover did that on my defender (laughs) it's not better everyone is doing it because it's cheaper to make one giant button with capacitive controls than to make six individual buttons and it is so so bad so we all just have to hang in there and yell and scream as much about this as possible and try to find the one car company that you that like pick one of these things that's the most important to you like my thing is like i don't think i can buy a car with stupid door handles and i think physical hvac those would maybe be my top two priorities but you can only do what you can do if, if in the end there's no car that has those two things that i just have to buy what i have to buy but we just have to make it through this terrible phase and come out the other side or we just need some brave car company to say no we're going to design their interior of our cars to be useful and not to be inexpensive and look, let's see in the showroom, but we were in a dark, dark period for cars. And I, I thought we'd be out of it by now, right? I thought this is going to happen. The first few generations of EVs are going to be like this. People are going to snap out of it. They're not snapping out of it. Or if they have, we haven't seen the fruits of that labor yet. They're getting worse. Brand new cars, like Volvo's new line of cars. Here's our new EVs. We made EVs before. Like we have Polestar and everything. We're experienced. We've done this before. This isn't even our first radio. Our new EV, no rear windscreen. Like, no rear window <laughs> at all. We'll just put a camera there. No, no Volvo, stop. What are you doing? What? Uh, maybe that's the Polestar. I forget which one it is. Uh, no screen in front of you, just a center screen, like the Model 3. It's like, have we learned nothing? Where are you going? What? Do, like, it's so <laughs> terrible. So I, I feel for this person. I understand the frustration, but the pickings out there are so slim, and there are so many bad ideas, and I would have more confidence they would go away if they weren't all less expensive that's the reason you know, less expensive in your eighty thousand dollar car we got to save the five cents we can't have six individual buttons on your steering wheel that's i think that's one of the most profound and and impactful changes that technology has seen in my lifetime that 
we you know it used to be not that long ago maybe you know 15 years ago screens were very expensive just in general like screen like any kind of screen technology you know growing up screens were very expensive that's why like you know you'd have you'd have like early computers that plugged into your tv because you you know most people would have a tv but you you know you wouldn't necessarily have the money to buy like a separate computer monitor so you'd plug everything into your tv or whatever and then you know later on you know cars for for most of cars existence couldn't have like bitmap screens they had you know dials and lights and occasionally at the you know in in like once you got into like you know the 80s and 90s and stuff you could have like little lcd segment displays and stuff but do you remember the buick that had a little i think it was a buick that had a crt in the dashboard i think we've talked about it before yeah <laughs> that someone did put a crt in a car in case you're wondering if that ever happened it was monochrome crt i believe but it was there <laughs> yep. terrible super terrible yeah but so like you know screens were expensive and so there was always so much effort put into trying to do whatever you could without a screen, like without having a screen. Like when, well, like even my first BMW that I got in like two thousand like nine or ten or whatever that was, the screen that would have given me the navigation system was like a five thousand dollar option. So I didn't take it. So it just had like you know the little like LCD segment display on the radio, and that was it. The reason it didn't have all these features was because screens were expensive. Only, and only in like the last, again, like 15 years maybe, that has flipped over so that now screens cost nothing, relatively speaking. Like screens are so cheap now that, yes, a screen is still more expensive than a button, but a screen it might actually be less expensive than... 25 buttons and all of their associated wiring and all of their service over the course of the vehicle's warranty period like if one of those buttons flakes out then they got to replace it like once you factor in the total cost of having all these buttons and stocks and everything that need to be like you know manufactured assembled installed maintained wired you know tested all that stuff it actually is now cheaper in a lot of cases to just put everything in software on the touchscreen. And the idea of that to tell someone 15 years ago that cars, cars, it's it's cheaper for cars to have a giant screen, a giant color, high resolution touchscreen. Like that's that's cheaper than having like 15 buttons. Yes, actually, in, in some cases, when you factor in certain things, yes, it actually is. Um, but anyway, going back to the actual question. I would I would suggest, despite everything we just said, you can get used to a lot of things that you that you might not think. Um, so, you know, things that are important about a car are things like, can it fit my family? Can it fit the stuff we have to do? Can it fit in my garage or whatever? Like, it, you know, physical, like large physical characteristics of it are important. Is it physically capable of? fitting in my life and handling the tasks that I want it to handle. Is it, you know, is it an EV or not? Is is it fuel efficient or not? Like the big questions like that, those all matter a lot. Stuff like whether you have to move your seat with physical controls or, or things on a touchscreen, that matters a lot less. So what I would suggest is, you know, shift your priority list. You know, these, a lot of these are like nice to haves, but maybe not requirements, um, because y- y- what you what you will find is that if you're willing to bend on a few of these kind of more superficial or, or less less important things, like you know, how often do you move your seat? If you move it every day, well, then how often it, how often you move it or how the, how you move it matters a lot. If you are mostly the only driver of your car and you don't move your seat that often, it matters a lot less. And, and by the way, with all, with all this technology, speaking of moving your seats and stuff, memory seats, the feature has been around, what, since the late 70s, early 80s? Still, still car companies are stingy about doing that. And sometimes when they do it, they only have two positions because they can't store the extra three kilobytes of memory. They can store. <laughs> like, it's insane. And if, if, you know, you mentioned seat movement, if you move the seat, you're probably also moving the mirrors. If you get one of these EVs where to adjust the side view mirrors and the seat, you have to use the touch screen and it doesn't have seat memory or it has enough seat memory for two people, but not three. And you have three people using the car. If every time you get in the car, you are swiping around on a touch screen to adjust both your mirrors and the seat, you are going to be hating life, right? And so when I say <laughs> prioritizing features, 
figure out like if you had if i had to prioritize them it would be like what things do you do most often and changing seats it may, you know again like mark said it may be something you never do or something you do almost every time you get in the car because it's a shared car for example among two or three people so think more about turn signals and less about <laughs> the hood release yeah right? the, so yeah. like stuff you use a lot yeah turn signals turn signals changing gears those are things you use a lot i would weight them way more heavily and door handles every time you get in the car use door handles or maybe you don't maybe you have your phone in your pocket and the door automatically pops open but like you know because that's you know things you can get used to but think about the thing you're gonna be doing every time because as annoying as it is to use the touch screen to open the glove box on a tesla you're going to open the glove box way less often than you're going to signal turns unless you're a bmw driver <laughs> <laughs> yeah but also you know, like to, to play a little bit of devil's advocate here like you know some some of some of these requirements are things that you could get used to if they weren't satisfied, and some of them you can't. So, for instance, if you really want a sunroof and the car doesn't have a sunroof, you're never going to get used to that. Yep, can can confirm, because that's where I am right now. <laughs> or, or if you don't want a sunroof and your head hits the headliner, it's always going to hit the headliner. <laughs> you're not going to shrink that fast. Yeah, like if you, you, know, you want radar adaptive cruise control, and if you if your car doesn't have that, you're never going to get used to it not having it. Like it, you'll just always not have it. Whereas, like if you say you want physical HVAC control buttons, you could actually get used to the screen just fine. You know, it wouldn't. It, it might not be as ideal, but like so that's like a little bit of a squishy requirement. What I would suggest is if there's an EV that you think you want or I might like, but it fails one of those like preferential things, like physical buttons for HVAC controls or something like that. Like I would suggest. Go test drive it or even if you can rent one for like a few days because a lot of that stuff, you'd be surprised how quickly you get used to it and it isn't a big deal. This is what Tesla people have been telling everyone else forever. Just try it, like rent one for a weekend or something, like try it and you'll see a lot of the stuff you think is a big deal is not a big deal. Whereas a lot of the stuff that you might not have thought of might be a bigger deal than you think. Like, I hate most Tesla door handles. Like as John was saying, like the door handles on Teslas are really annoying. All of them. Every model Tesla has differently annoying door handles. <laughs> Even the new Cybertruck, which we haven't talked about and probably won't. They found another way to have annoying, stupid door handles. <laughs> that is, the, if, if anything, Tesla's most innovative department might be the department that makes annoyingly bad door handles. It's really important for the Cybertruck to be aerodynamic, Marco. You don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, like they just keep <laughs> finding new creative ways to make bad, annoying door handles. But anyway, um, you know, that like to me, the the door handles are worse on Teslas than the lack of certain physical controls. Like because the lack of physical controls, like a lot, a lot of that you just get used to within the first day or two of driving the car. And it just isn't as big of a deal as you think beforehand. Uh, I, uh, yes, but no. So let's take an example. Uh, Aaron's XC90 that has the HVAC controls on the center screen. I am used to it. So you are correct, but it is objectively crappier not to have <laughs> physical controls. You know what I mean? So it's not that you're wrong because you do get used to it, but just because you're used to it doesn't mean it's superior. Not having a gauge cluster in a model three is crappy. Like I, I'm sorry, Tesla people. It's crappy. It's not an improvement. Oh, but you can see the th two inches above your hood. But I don't care. It's worse. No, you're totally right on that. They, they, they actually, although on, on that front, a lot of the uh, a recent trend with a couple of car makers has been to still have the instrument cluster in front of you, but to make it a very slim, low profile one. So you get, yes. you get the benefit of, oh, you have better visibility over the hood, but we've yep. shrunk the thing down. And Didn't the Prius do that a thousand years ago? Oh, the, Pri the, the Prius also had the offset one, I believe. Um, it, had, it had like the, uh, the Toyota used to say, oh, it's better for your eyes because they're focusing farther away. It's like, yeah, it's six inches farther Didn't away. Didn't the Civic <laughs> do one of those too, like around 2004 or so? I don't think think so civic civic has always had an instrument cluster i believe i can tell you for sure the mustang mach e does that it has a very small display that's your gauge cluster that has the bare minimum of of useful and usable information but that's 
all you really need. And it's a little slimline display right where you expect it to be. And it's, it, I, I was going to say it's perfect. That may be a bit uh, dramatic, but it's really good. And then they have the hilariously large center uh, touchscreen thing where you would expect it to be. But at least you have some amount of gauges in the center. Like, I know you can get used to it. And, and I, I heard you say, Marco, that, you know, you're on Team Casey for this gauge cluster thing. But like, to talk to the Tesla zealots, you can get used to the center screen. I'm not saying you can't get used to it, but it's objectively worse. It's just <laughs> worse. Yeah, the, the mirror adjustments is another example. I, yes. I think of this every time I adjust it, because we do have shared cars in my family. Every time I adjust these side mirrors, they're powered because we have the luxury of powered side mirrors because they used to not be. And you used to have to reach over and do them. and It was really annoying. Uh, kids, ask your parents. Um, <laughs> but I, I adjust them without looking anywhere with my eyes except for at the mirrors. You yep. can't do that with a touch screen. You have to look at the touch screen to yep. navigate. And then maybe if you're lucky, you have swipe controls in your steering wheel to do the adjustments once you've navigated. But literally, because they're physical controls and they're always in the same place and I can feel them in the dark, I don't have to look at them at all. I can I can and do routinely adjust the mirrors without looking anywhere except for at the mirrors. That is a better experience than using a touch screen. And I don't want them to save the $5 that it would take to save on all the wiring or whatever. I'd rather have those controls there. So when I saw like the latest Volvo coming out with nothing on the door panel, including no window up down switches, no mirror adjustment switches, like no, no Volvo. There should be something on that door. There's a reason people put controls on the door because it's a convenient place for your left hand to be when you're adjusting the mirrors. And if you, you know, oh, just, I don't, I want to take those people and shake them. Like, there's no excuse to be doing this for a 2024 model to have a, a door card with literally nothing on it except for an electronic door release to get out. Bad. Yeah, so I, I, I think you guys are broadly correct, though, that you need to have some amount of prior, prioritization here. And I think that some things will be must-haves and some things are want-to-haves. And... You know, you're never going to get used to, as you had said, Marco, or maybe it was John, one of you said you're never going to get used to not having a sunroof. I can confirm because that's where I am. Um, but you can get used to having on-screen HVAC controls. They still suck, but you can get used to it. They're not that And bad. eventually you just have to, you're going to have to compromise. That being said, I I haven't driven my my parents' Chevy, uh, was it Bolt or Volt? I always get it wrong. Bolt uh, in a couple of months now, but... I think it may actually meet all of these requirements. Now, the problem, though, is that most people who buy an EV want to look fancy and cool and hip. And a Chevy Bolt does not look fancy nor cool nor hip. But it is a stunningly good EV given the the price that it costs. Like, I'm grading on a curve here. I'll be the first to tell you. But it is stunningly good for what it is. And I think it might actually meet all of these requirements. Um, for me... When I, I you know, I've, we haven't bought cars since 2018, and I have no current plan to replace either of our cars. Um, but for me, I absolutely will not buy a car without CarPlay, and basically everything else is malleable. I vastly prefer cars with a sunroof, but I bought one without because all told, it was the best option I had. Like, I am a devout sunroof person. As much as John hates sunroofs, or some roofs, whatever. I love them. It kills me that my car does not have a sunroof, but eventually you just gotta, you're gonna have to compromise. That's the way this works. Um, and so for me, the only thing I can think of that I literally will not compromise on is CarPlay with a close second probably being, I really dislike front wheel drive a lot, a lot, a lot. And so it would take a lot for me to get into a front wheel drive car. I would probably cave on that if I absolutely had to, but it would take a lot. If I were to buy a car today, I would probably buy the Honda, or no, I'm sorry, the Kia EV6 GT, preferably, which is very odd looking. I've heard very crummy things about Hyundai and Kia dealers. So I might hate that car if I were to buy it today, but that's probably what I would get. Or they just came out with, um, what is it, the Ionic 5? No, Ionic 6. There's a Hyundai version of the Kia EV6. I forget what it is. Or I mean, it, it, there's something that was just announced. Is that the one with the, with the square lights everywhere? It looks like pixels. Yes, but there was... Honestly, they I think just those look really cool. New, they, did, they just announced a new one that's like a direct competitor to the EV6. And for the life of me, I can't remember what exactly it's called. But nonetheless, I would probably buy one of those. 
because it seems to fit all of my preferences. Note, I did not say requirements. It seems to fit all my preferences the best. Uh, the chat room is saying the Ionic 6. That's probably... Ac- no, the Ionic 6 is ugly as sin. I don't know. It's something else. They have like an N line, I think they call it, which is like their hot rod version of their... Maybe it is the, uh, the Ionic 5. I don't recall. It doesn't really matter. But anyways, I'd buy one of those. And again, you're just going to have to compromise. You're, that's the way this works. You're going to have, or or in some cases, spend like a quarter billion dollars on, you know, a, a Porsche Taycan or Taycan or whatever. That's what called. I was saying if you, how, how uh, about your seating situations? Because maybe the only one that fits your requirements is $200,000 Porsche. I mean, honestly, I'm pretty sure Tiff's i3 fits this requirement list perfectly. <laughs> yeah, people don't know what their requirement lists are until they see the i3 and they say, oh, I didn't have not but ugly on my list. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, they, I mean, but Marco, you make a good point that, if you want an EV that actually works reasonably well for regular people, you're probably going to want to look at, I know BMW and budget probably don't belong in the same sentence, but you're probably going to look at, want to look at a budget EV uh, like the i3, which is not exactly budget, but kind of in that spirit, or the the Chevy Bolt, or something along those lines, because they are not fancier, trendier, hip, or cool, or whatever, but they do cross off or they do check all the check boxes. So what's more important to you getting all of these things on your very long list or looking cool. And that's for you to decide. Well, and not even just necessarily looking cool, but like when you, when you think I want to buy an EV, what you, what you typically think of is the big names in EVs. So you think Tesla, you know, you, you, you think like the, 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 the models that you've seen either where the whole company is only an EV company like Tesla and Rivian or Lucid or whatever, or you, you think of like the, the car models that were launched as electric models, like, you know, conceptually from their makers, and all of those are are electric. And when you when you look at either the you know the all electric kind of tech forward companies or those like you know EV like you know statement models from other companies, those tend to be the most aggressive in their like you know efforts to be futuristic to get away from a lot of the stuff that we're saying we actually tend to want. Um, you know, because a lot a lot of the, the you know the the clean minimal design and that takes away all the buttons that we like. Yeah. A lot of that is like you know an effort to be futuristic and to be a statement. What will probably give you better luck is not only necessarily going with budget models, but going with models of cars that were not always electric. So from co- from companies that have made gas cars forever, like you know, get like the the electric you know BMW three series or whatever, like you know, like the 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 electric versions of cars that car makers are now like reluctantly making, <laughs> they keep being drag kicking, screaming into EVs. Those actually will probably give you more of your list if what you're looking for is basically an old style car, which is what this basically is. That will give you more of that than the like cool concept car from from the tech company. Yeah, Mercedes really screwed that up by not going the BMW route, but instead deciding to make an entire parallel line of cars for their EVs. BMW said, we're going to make a 5 Series, you can get an electric and not electric, right? Mercedes says, you can get S-Class, or we have this whole other line over here, the EQ S. <laughs> not the same car. You want an E-Class, or do you want an EQ E? <sighs> not confusing and, at and all. Let me tell you, the EQ line, the interiors of the cars is way dumber. Way dumber. <laughs> the, and the, the, bad, the bad thing about BMW is, yes, it's true that the interiors will be similar between the electronic and regular, but the regular cars have gotten dumber too. So yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, but at least the door handle should be semi-normal. And by the way, I was just <laughs> looking at a picture of the Ionic 6, which I do think is the one you were thinking of, Casey. Stupid door handles. What a surprise. Yes, it does. No, no. The, the Ionic 6 is ugly as sin, if it's you It's a sedan. Me. It's, that's what you're talking about. Four-door sedan, right? No, it's not. I'm talking about their hatch. I know, I know the EV6 is not really a sedan. It's a short, squat crossover with bad headroom. Great. Love it. Oh, and the one that I said looks cool is the Ionic 5. Yeah, it's the Ionic 5N. Yeah, the, uh, five, the 5 I guess the one with with the fake uh, electric EV gear shifts. People are loving that. <laughs> the, they they basically make the EV engine go yeah, for no yeah. for no friggin' reason. It's so stupid. And they they, they interrupt <laughs> power when you do the fake shifts. This is great. This is a car with Ugh. I believe one fixed gear ratio. And when you hit the little flappy paddle, they were intentionally interrupt uh, power to the electric engine to make you feel like you're shifting. People love it. Apparently, uh, talk about skeuomorphism. I'm guessing that lasts two model years and then discontinued. Well, it'll last. It'll last until everybody who remembers what that's imitating is dead. No, it'll, it'll <laughs> last until everyone tries it and realizes, oh, actually, it's just better to turn this off. No, people try it and they love it. They love it because they're people who know what that is. Like they, it, because it doesn't really. You can do a convincing job of pretending to be an internal combustion engine when you have like all the torque all the time. You just 
interrupted in ways that, you know, they make the sounds, they do all the things, and everybody who tries it, they're like, I thought this would be so dumb, but I'm having so much fun. But those people will eventually die, and then we'll be rid of this. But unfortunately, we are also those people, so we'll also be dead. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> you are. You know what that's imitating. You know about gear shift. Well, I know what it's imitating, but I, I ran away screaming from it once I found electric vehicles because they're better. Yeah, but if you tried it, you'd be like, this. I admit this is fun. It's basically a video game. It's a dumb video game. <laughs> I will say one other thing, though, like, you know, in the in the, like the trade off between, you know, old style controls in a, in like a car that was started out as a gas car and was later made electric versus a car that was like electric from the start or a company that made electric cars from the start. What you are losing by sticking with like the old classic car model from the old car company, even after it has become an EV you don't usually get some of the really nice, interesting, like techie features of the pure EV companies. Like Tesla and Rivian, for all of their shortcomings, especially in not supporting CarPlay. But anyway, <laughs> for all those shortcomings, like one of the, like I, I mentioned um, a few months back, I really missed dog mode when I, I had Teslas for a while and then I had to get the, the Land Rover for my sand permit. And I really missed dog dog mode which is a thing where you could like leave your car and tap two buttons on the screen and it keeps the climate control running so if you have to leave your dog in the car and go into a store your dog doesn't freeze or overheat uh and and it shows on the screen like my dog is fine here's the temperature so nobody like breaks into your car to free your dog either this is a feature that i assumed would be on any ev and it's just not it's it's on almost none of them there's a whole bunch of those features where yeah, it seems like kind of goofy stuff that, you know, usually Tesla will be the first ones to come up with a lot of this stuff. And it seems goofy. And it seems like, why would anybody ever use that? And then you use it. And you're like, oh, that's actually really nice. <laughs> All cars should have this feature. <laughs> um, and a lot of the, like, you know, the, the the newer companies that are tech focused and very, you know, EV, you know, native, like it's mostly Tesla and Rivian, they tend to have way nicer features like that and way more of them. And the old car companies that have, you know, more old style approaches, you know, less integration, less software control over their own vehicles, less ability to run over the air updates because they're tying together a million different things from a million different providers, stuff like that. Like the, the older companies tend not to have many of those tech forward or clever new features. Um, so it's it, it's a trade off you're making. If you want to stick with the old style controls and physicality and everything, that's great. But you will be missing out on a lot of that new fun tech stuff that EVs do offer from the, you know, the the overly minimalist companies. All right, moving on. Uh, Josiah Katz writes, how's, how's call sheet going? Well, breaking news as of today, doing really freaking great because our friends, well, because our friends at Upgrade, uh, spoiler alert, have awarded call sheet an upgradey, which I was very, very excited to hear. Oh, congratulations. Well, thank Look you. At that I, timing. Yeah, no, perfect, right? Um, I didn't even put this in the show notes. I think this was John that uh, put the topic in there. But yeah, uh, Jason had sent me a message saying, in so many words, you really need to listen to the beginning of Upgrade, <laughs> uh, which I did with the family, actually. We all listened to it together for the very first time. And, and and uh, the kids were extremely excited, which was very cool. Um, so, yeah, that, that was very kind of them. So check out Upgrade this week. Uh, but no, Call Sheet's awesome. doing well. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very honored. I'm genuinely quite honored to have received an Upgrade. Um, and, and as Mike had said on the show, you know, there were other opportunities where if this was just I'm going to give this to my friend, they could have done this before. But uh, it seems like I, I genuinely earned this one, which I'm quite happy about. Um, but but it's go it's been going well. Um, uh, development has slowed a little bit because life has been getting quite busy, as it has for basically everyone in this time of year. Um, but, you know, releases are still happening. In fact, uh, just a couple hours ago, a release just finished a one-week rollout um, uh, earlier this evening. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff I want to do, which is in contrast to most of my other apps where there were things I wanted to do, but you know, if I get to it, I get to it. If I don't, I don't, I have a laundry list of things that I desire to do, um, to call to in for call sheet. My first priority list, as I call it is only one item, but let's see the, there are 44 other items that I have <laughs> noted as things I would like to do. Now, a lot of these, you know, some of these are small, some of these are invested investigations, but you know, a lot of these are features and I feel like for the most part, I think I've gotten most of the low hanging fruit. There's a couple of exceptions there, um, but I've gotten most of the low hanging fruit. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, 
And I feel like the app is in a pretty good spot. There's definitely ways I want to in, enhance and expand, but it's in a pretty good state. And um, with regard to money, it's done pretty well. Uh, it's not, it is not done as, it, I, tried, I just tried to start seven sentences all at the same time. <laughs> so um, if, if you look at how much time it took me to write call sheet, which was around about six months as a broad estimate, if this was the only income I had, I don't think I earned six months worth of income from it, if that makes sense. Like if if I hadn't been doing call sheet and instead was like doing independent consulting at, you know, roughly independent consulting rates, uh, I, I would have been, I would have lost money. But it's in the ballpark now, which is really freaking great. And what's incredibly great is that in theory... I'll be getting another payment of a lot of this money. You know, hope, hopefully a, a large portion of this money will come again next year. And that, that my friends is incredibly empowering and incredibly cool. So, you know, my hope is as I continue to add features and fix bugs and so on and so forth, hopefully that will encourage people not to abandon their <laughs> subscriptions. It will hopefully encourage people to go ahead and tell, tell their friends about it. And hopefully their friends and family and whatnot will subscribe. And, you know, hopefully over time, this becomes another item in the, you know, financial quiver, if you will, uh, which is really important to me because as much as I am so lucky for what I do, and I'm so lucky that I'm able to put a roof over our heads and food on the table doing it, you know, it's still scary. You know, if, if Marco or John drop dead tomorrow, God help us and God help me, that would be a really big financial issue for me. I mean, leaving aside the fact that I'd be devastated that one of my you know dearest friends has, has had something happen, it would be a real financial problem. And so hopefully over time, you know, all three of us, and I think Marco has done a very good job of this, but he had a pretty big head start. But, you know, we all diversify and have other means of income. And then so now this is a this has moved the needle on the family income, which is, which is ex exactly what I had hoped and, and what I what I had dreamed would happen. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, if, if there's anything you two want to ask, I'm happy to entertain questions. But uh, in short, it's been going really well, and I'm riding a real big high right now uh, on account of the upgradey. So uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a good spot. Yeah, that's awesome. First of all, the upgradey is a huge deal. That is awesome. I've been around long enough. I've had you know enough success in my app career that I've gotten a decent number of, of like awards from blogs and podcasts and everything. It matters every single time. It never stops feeling cool. It's yep. it never stops being a huge honor. I absolutely love it. I'm secretly hoping that like, you know, when I when I do my big when I release my big rewrite uh, you know, for the, in next year sometime, I'm hoping to get awards for that as well. Yeah. That matters a lot and it's always a big deal. You're not going to get an upgrade though. Well, I had yeah, I know I have a lifetime achievement, so I can't lifetime achievement award. So you were ineligible. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I can get a, I can get a Mac Stories award for the rewrite. I think I don't I don't know. It's there's going to be a lot of competition. On, what I would really want is an ADA, but we'll see. That's yeah, I hear that. I st that's that's my white whale. I want an ADA so badly. Yeah, I, I feel like the idea. It doesn't feel like the ADA has been devalued through no fault of the people who've awarded. Congratulations to all of them. But I feel like I, sometimes it's kind of like the Oscars. Sometimes you question the judgment of the Academy. You know what I mean? It, I wouldn't say they're being devalued, but but they they have shifted over time with different priorities. And that's first of all, I think that actually gives me a chance because in the original definition of the ADAs, I stood no chance. <laughs> like I, because I'm not that great of a designer. All right, right, right. You just got to hope you're using whatever API Apple is promoting that year. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but I I think like. I'm I'm leaning so heavily into Apple's new stuff, like with SF symbols and Swift UI. Like I I think I have a better chance than ever. Not to, that might not be enough of a chance, but it's certainly a better chance than ever. So we'll see. It's an honor just to be nominated. It actually it genuinely is. It really honestly yeah, it is. is. It was if you think of if you think especially on iOS, how many iOS apps are released every year? It's it's worse than the the Oscars. It's just like you get like a one in two million chance. Yeah, but also like like the. The kind of app that used to win ADAs doesn't really exist anymore. Like, nobody makes that kind of app anymore. So if they were trying to give out ADAs for just that style of app, they wouldn't have enough candidates every year. So that at least at least enough good ones. Um, so, you know, it had to shift over time, and the app market is constantly shifting. But yeah, honestly, that is my white whale. I, I am going to keep trying until I win one, and it, I, it might never happen, but that, like... If I ever do, just know that will mean a tremendous amount to me. Like that, that will be like 
that will make my year. That will make my decade. I want one so badly, and but we'll see. I, <laughs> I, I never again. I never think I have that great a chance. But you could just probably buy an old one on, on eBay. <laughs> it's not the. I could totally, but that's not. It's not the same. You know. So we were just talking about uh, people were selling Eddie Awards. You guys don't remember this, but back in the day when uh, the was it Mac user? Yeah, the uh, magazine would sell the little stat, or maybe it's Macworld. No, it's it Macworld. I have one. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the big statues with the person holding up the Mac SE over their head. Which, by the way, that is the coolest award I've gotten. I think I got one. I got one for Instapaper. Yeah, but anyway, like those those are available on eBay now for going for a lot of money. Apparently, so you may be able to get an ADA cube uh, eventually when someone dies in their estate, puts it up on eBay. Yeah, but I don't want someone else's ADA cube on my desk. I want I want one that I was issued that I that well, I. Well, you take what you can get. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if, if i get desperate enough maybe but no <laughs> and then, like, the old ones had batteries in them right to light up or whatever so i wonder if that battery will still be good in 20 years <laughs> i think i think that was actually user replaceable and now we've come full circle baby yeah it wasn't or wasn't there an eye fix it Terrence? somebody actually I did like so. a like a battery replacement guide on those i think half as a joke but it was actually real <laughs> yeah um, anyway so so all this is to say casey winning upgrade is a huge deal and that's awesome no it really it really is and you know for me I, I don't know if, if you and I have ever met, Marco, but I have a, a wee bout of imposter syndrome. And <laughs> so, you? But yeah, I know, right? And and so for for me, I mean, all, all kidding aside, for me to have, have won an award for my work and, you know, I, I absolutely had help on on the app, but it's still my work. And, and that is a tremendous compliment. It's a tremendous honor. And it's it's a little bit of... It's it's a it's a way for me to convince the nastier subconscious, my you know, the, or the nastier subconscious part of my brain that no, uh, when you really do try hard, you actually can make this work, you know. And and even though I do believe that for the most part, as with every as with everyone, but especially with me, a lot of times I feel like I'm faking it, and you know I'm going to be found out tomorrow that I'm a big dummy, and so on and so forth. And I mean, hell, listen to the first two years of this program, and I think my confidence, if for <laughs> to the degree that it existed at all, was not what it is now. And so for for me to have this t- tangible to a degree you know evidence that when i try hard and and i do something difficult i can succeed like that's a really incredible compliment and a really incredible feeling and it really helps me feel better about doing the thing you know the the job that i do and and so i'm extremely thankful for it and yeah i didn't put this topic in the show notes but it was extremely fortuitous timing so thank you john yeah i'm 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 not out here doing it for the awards i do it for the money and i get neither <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Womp womp. Uh, thank you so much to our members who are the exclusive supporters of this episode. You can join us at atp.fm slash join, and we will talk to you next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do Search Marco and Casey wouldn't let him Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter You can follow them At C-A-S-E-Y-L I-S-S So that's Casey Liss M-A-R-C-O A-R-M E-N-T Marco Armin S-I-R-A-C U-S-A Syracuse It's accidental What was your Eddie Award for? Was it uh, Overcast? Instapaper. Instapaper. Yeah, I, I got a. It, well, Instapaper was early enough in the App Store that I got a whole bunch of awards for things that don't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, the different categories. That's the other thing. <laughs> Unlike the Oscars, the Eddie, uh, the, the Eddie Award, the uh, the the uh, ADA categories have really changed from year to year, just depending on whatever Apple feels like doing. Of course, yeah, because again, like you know, the app market is so different. Like right now, like there, how many like 
indie developers are there that are like crafting pixel perfect UI today. Like there's not that many yeah. left. I mean, there are still there are still ones out there. That's why it's a kind of fun when when somebody wins and you're like, not only is that app show off the API I want to use, Apple wants you to use and does all the things right, but it also is like pixel perfect and beautiful. They do exist. They're just more rare than they used to be. Yeah, exactly. And like and but the thing is, like, there are so few of them left that I like Apple probably doesn't have a lot to choose from for the ADAs each year for that kind of thing. That's why uh, how many years went by with this? I think they did like no Mac apps got ADAs for a bunch of years. Yeah, exactly. Because like how many awesome new Mac apps are being released every year that aren't web views? Yeah, like it's not it's not a <laughs> huge number, unfortunately. And so I, I like I, I wonder, too, like how. You know, there's always a question of like, you know, what they're going to try to promote with the ADAs and like, you know, so this year I'm sure anything good on Vision OS is going to be, you know, substantially looked at. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, but, you know, they, it's it's always, you know, they, they talk about other stuff like there's always like, you know, diversity and inclusion metrics. There's like fun metrics. There's games. And- yeah, they, they, all the game categories they have. Do you see all the game categories this past year or whatever? No, that, were, that was like the App Store. Where it's not that was the, the like best of the App Store, right? Which yeah. is different. Yeah. But, but even though it's like it's... I look at those awards and it's so I can't figure out how they pick how Apple picks like game of the year because it's not the same way that, for example, a gaming website would pick its game of the year. I feel like gaming websites are picking it like which they think is the best game and Apple is using something else. Not that the games that win aren't good games. They're all good games, right? There's a lot of good games out there. But like why this game? I think it's like I think Apple will pick, for example, I think one of the games they'll pick like a game that is only made for iOS and is a good game over a game that is better, but it's not a great port for iOS. You know what I mean? Well, of course, because that's what that's what they're picking. They're not picking the best game in the entire games industry. They're picking the best game on their platforms. Oh, I know, but they'll have a game on their platform that's a better game and it was ported to iOS, but the port is only okay. But in the end, once you're into the game and playing the game, the game is better, but this game was made exclusively for iOS and uses all of Apple's APIs and isn't available on other platforms, and it gets the award. It's the it's the platform tax in their awards. It's kind of hard to take them seriously when it comes to games. Well, but again, I, I think they're they're looking for different things too. Like, you know, like what, what you look for in a game for, you know, if you're if you're like, you know, a a gaming website that covers, you know, the, the major AAA games of the world. That's a very different audience with very different priorities and very different games than what succeeds on iPhones for people. Like it's it's a it's so different. It's a radically different market, you know. And and Apple has different incentives, of course, as well. You know, because they are like you know you don't usually get a whole bunch of like you know game of the year awards like from Nintendo or from Sony. Uh, in this case, Apple is the platform, so of course they're going to have not only different priorities but different incentives. Uh, you know, so the, yeah, of course they're going to prefer games that are you know exclusive to them and show off their stuff really well and take advantage of any initiative they want to push. You know, the games that are in Apple Arcade or game games that are like cross platform that you know work on your Apple TV also or whatever. Like, of course they're going to push that stuff harder. That's that's the nature of them being the platform owner and also issuing awards. 